Welcome back to another edition of the Rod Cast. Oh, we got a great show Usually planned Tuesdays, for you. Usually Tuesdays are pretty low. Key. It's Tuesday. We're in the midst of March Madness. Uh, March so we'll Madness. Get a little bit of that. Uh, so we'll get into a little bit of that. Talk about the and, and the women. Uh, what and, they'll be doing and, in the NCAA uh, tournament. The tournament. Also, we'll talk tournament. Texas football. Also, we'll talk yes, Texas spring football starts up on the 40 acres today. That gives us an excuse to talk a lot of Texas football, which we'll do early and often. We'll do it here in this segment. Also, We'll go we'll behind the burnt on curve. Next we'll segment, talk some Texas curve. football. It's a beautiful Texas time of year, especially when there are high expectations yeah, high for the Texas football, football, football team. A lot of people think that the Longhorns have a chance to win the SEC in their first year. Expectations are high. Sark says he's obsessed with winning a national title. It starts today on the field. And we'll get into it. Also, we'll talk NFL Cowboys. NFL Cowboys. To make the move. To make the move. Scott was in. Uh, talk about back to the battle. We'll talk about that also. Farewell letter. It's all Cowboys letter. All Cowboys man. Let's talk Cowboys and what the plan may be going forward to replace them. And Nick Casario actually had an interview with the folks down there at 610 in H-Town. Got some really good audio from Nick Casario talking about his philosophy and free agency. As he is known to Texas fans, cook Casario because he's cooking up a lot of trays in the kitchen. So we'll get into that and talk about that coming up. Uh, in the uh, second hour of the show yeah. when we get to some NFL news. So some niggas got a Raj rant for you. That's also coming up That's in the second hour. There will probably be NFL related as well. football should have been doing, talked about it uh, probably a lot. Last year, I've been talking about it for a long time, advocating for it. And I think the Texas coaching staff, either listen to me or great minds think alike. We'll talk about that. And we go behind the burnt orange curtain. Got some advice from my man, Queen viewers as well. Uh, and we'll talk about all the storylines. We can't hit them all, but we'll try our best at all the storylines coming out of Texas Spring Ball. Before we do, let's introduce you to the rest of the crew. Uh, he is He's got a hustle spirit. I don't know what his name is paid, but he's up on the page. That's the show. Ain't no force one case for hustle. This man is a hustle man of many talents. He is my friend, neighbor, and co host. It's Patrick Davis, y'all. What's going on, brother? Oh, it's going good on a Tuesday morning. We get NCAA tournament action tonight. We'll find out who Texas is playing. I'm looking forward Mm -hmm. to it tonight. It's going to be a lot of fun, but let me first introduce you to my co-host. He is a proud alumni of DBU. He's got more papers than Dunder Mifflin and watches more film than Siskel and Ebert. He is the new Rod Father of Austin Sports Radio, Mr. Rod. I appreciate the intro as always. Uh, And also, uh, let's not forget about the people because uh, you guys are the most important part of the show. So you can always interact, comment, uh, questions, suggestions, anything on the text line. 512-447-3776. Patrick, the real MVP, will also have our horn headlines coming up here momentarily. We'll also have uh, the big fat of the day that will be coming up at 645. That's always a fun topic of conversation, so we look forward to that. Uh, there's a musically theme for the week that will be revealed to you by Patrick as well coming up around 645. Uh, so we got a lot to get to there. We got off the record. Uh, we got who said that later on in the show. So we got a lot of different items uh, to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, keep you entertained. Uh, with our info team and our uh, here info team on the broadcast. All right, let's get uh, right. the horn let's headlines first. The then we'll come back and talk about uh, we'll little NCAA about, uh, tournament discussions. Uh, we'll talk spring football uh, as well. Uh, we'll talk about the horns, uh, we'll basically. We're on the field. The first one, man, actually hit us up with those horn headlines. headlines. All right, your Horn Headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Texas baseball starts a two-game miniseries tonight after against the Air Force Academy Falcons. This will be the third year in a row the two teams have played each other in an early series matchup, with Texas being up 2-1 to one in those meetings. Texas will send Grant Fontenot to the mound, who threw for three innings, only allowing one hit in his last outing. In the MLB, the reigning National League Cy Young winner Blake Snell signed a deal yesterday with the San Francisco Giants. The two-year deal is reportedly for $62 million and ends an extended free agency for the ace. The Houston Astros had been in conversations with Snell. However, they could not come close enough to Snell's demands and will continue to search for more starting pitching. And the NCAA tournament begins tonight with two of the first four matchups trying to make it to the field of 64. <coughs> 216 Keith Wagner and Howard kick off the action at 540 with the winner moving on to face North Carolina and then roughly 810 
Colorado State will take on Virginia in a matchup to take the 10 seed against Texas on Thursday. And that is your Horn Headlines. All right, thank you, Patrick, for the Horn Headlines. You know, one of the things I love about the tournament, I'm not a huge college basketball fan, you know, so I, I'm, I'm like most fans. I'm like, guys, I watch Texas. And whoever whatever team from Syrian, and whoever whatever team from Syrian, because I'm not a Washington team. Until March, like everybody, until March, like until March, like everybody, until March, like everybody else, and then boom, you know, dive in and talk about college basketball. Yeah, but what I do love about you guys, what I love about you guys, what I love about you it is a, it's a, it's a, it's a good that nerd time because all, all these random stats come out and these big the patterns, you know, the patterns the the trend the trend the trend going to the tournament team. So I don't pick this. I'm not gonna lie. I love. I'm not gonna lie. I love that. I get way too deep. I get way. Like I said, it's and one of my here's here's one of the favorite. And I kind of build my bracket. I build my bracket. I build my bracket off these trends. Sometimes you kind of build these trends. Sometimes build your bracket. All right. Since since 1997, when Arizona won the national title, no team west of Texas has won it all. Texas has. Since then, I think to myself, man, that's a hell of a that's a hell of a trend. Of a, hard to ignore that trend. That's a trend. Uh, right? That's a hell of a trend. It's hard to ignore. Uh, we start looking at it. And, and, and it got all kind of really cool ones like this. I mean, you go look at it. Um, since seeding began in 1978, every NCAA champion, 100 percent of them. Uh, to play in a conference uh, tournament, made it to at least their conference semis, their conference semis. and won at least basically won at least one game in the conference tournament. If they played in one, now not every champion has played in one. There were eight champions that didn't even have a conference tournament. So they didn't play. Uh, but it, like I said, that's I love little trends like that, and I get I help kind of build my bracket. Out backwards, working with all of these really cool trends. I mean, there are hundreds of these things. So trust me, you. I'm sure you have your own that you think are your favorite. Patrick, I'm sure you have yours too. Uh, but about the Colorado State game and the uh, Colorado State and Virginia game that Texas fans obviously paying a lot of attention to because they're going to play yeah. the winner uh, that first four matchup. How about this one? Um, Colorado State will represent the Mountain West Conference in the first four. The Mountain West Conference is 0 and 4 in the play. In the play. Over. Double digit Mountain West Conference seeds are one in 26 all time in the tournament, with only six of those losses by seven or fewer points. The Mountain West Conference has only two upset wins by seeding since 2007 and is one in 11 all time. So it's just it, basically, I'm looking at Colorado State as a as one of those teams. I'm thinking, man, I don't, I, I'd rather play Colorado State than you said. Did you like the Jimmy matchup? Yeah. I, I mean, I don't really like either matchup, but I prefer the. I, I just feel like Colorado State can do damage. They mm -hmm. feel like one of those teams that Texas is going to come out flat against, and it just be trouble yeah. for them. That's yeah. what it feels like. I, it, what's interesting is Colorado State's a favorite in this game, even though most projections would have them losing. So most projections would have Virginia winning. However, the bookies are saying two and a half points right now for Colorado State. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's no yeah, interest it's, in there. By the way, I'll throw this out there. We did put it up. Uh, if you go to hornfm.com, we do have a pool for brackets. If you hey, want to join, I'm already hey. in there, and I that it's not my final bracket yet. So I, I threw one together last night so we get people in there. We're getting there, <laughs> but I have not, not gone final with that bracket yet. I got to do a little bit more research as I get into it. But if you want to join it, you want to play along with us, uh, here on the horn, uh, hornfm.com, that a little thing for bracket mania. You click on that, it'll take you right to our pool. And uh, you can go and join and play along with us with your practice. All right, um, I'll do that because I haven't done that yet. Uh, I'll do that tonight, actually, and fill out my bracket. And I'm a one bracket guy. I'm a, you know, I'm a, I'm a one woman man. I'm a one bracket man. I don't, you know, yeah, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a multi bracket guy either. I don't like. I like to root. I, I, I don't have enough bandwidth in my brain to to be thinking like. Well, I want them to win now, and then if they nope. lose, though, I need that. Nope. And it's just root for that team, and I'm either right or I'm wrong. Because then I'll have people, and they'll be like, my bracket did really well. And you're like, well, how many did you fill out? They're like, exactly. like what's that like, You're not good. You just played the There you go. Exactly. You, you, exactly. you just bought a lot of, yeah. a lot of lottery just tickets. That's all you bought a lottery tickets. That's all you, <laughs> but I get it, though. I mean, if, you, if some people are really I mean, that into it, I know with you. I don't have that kind of time. I just got to focus on one bracket. I get that done. And usually my bracket is busted pretty early on, like a lot of Americans. It's a lot of red ink. A lot of it. Yeah. Those big red X's like, 
I don't like looking at my bracket. Once I see too many of them, once I see too many big red heads, I'm going to get into some more. Obviously, tonight, the big games alone, because they'll play the winner of the Colorado Virginia game. I'm still going to be torn. 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 I'm still going to be torn.
uh, go through teaching every guy exactly how things are done, what's expected. They'll be able to observe the older guys. They'll be able the older guys will talk to them about what's expected, about the methods, about, you know, the culture, about how, how things are done. All of these little things that Sark had to do his first two years. And he had to teach every player almost individually what's expected and how Texas is going to their methods, uh, their practices, all that different stuff. He won't have to do that anymore. That'll save him time there. Um, and I think the real question will be the, the leadership on the team, which Texas had on phenomenal leadership. You know, who are going to be those leaders that step up in the spring? Because you lost a lot of that leadership, right? You lost a Christian yeah. Jones, good leader on the line. You lost uh, that, that wide receiver room was full of leadership. Jalen Ford. We're talking about Xavier Worthy, Jay Witt, yes. Uh, you're talking about the defensive line, Byron Murphy, yeah. Tavondre Sweat were leaders. Jalen Ford was a good yeah. leader for you. So I, the talent to me, I mean, a talent's overwhelming for Texas. I don't necessarily, I'm not questioning their talent at all. I think Texas got first world problems talent wise. Um, I think the real question is about the chemistry, the culture, the cohesion of this team with so many new faces and the loss of so much um, high level talent, but also high level leadership. And football character. Yeah, I mean, th that is always a place. And I, I think Sark's done a good job so far of trying to create as many leaders as he can and, you know, teaching those leaders to pass it down. And we saw it from, you know, two years ago to last year that the leadership grew a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But now you're right that so many of those people, because there's more, like if you think about it two years ago, there was Bichon and Roshan were really the two main guys that were leading things. And they passed it down and created a bunch of new leaders last year. But then, you know, when you send 11 people to the combine and you send all these people to draft, you're going to lose some leadership on your team. Uh, that's where guys like Jade Barron is going to have to step up in that secondary and become more of a leader, being a more veteran player. That's where, uh, you know, you're going to have to see, I mean, maybe an Ethan Burke step up on that defensive line who's oh, been yeah, there a little be bit any, more. Any of these guys, uh, yeah. But Quinn Ewers on the offense has to be the man right now to pull this team together and be that veteran to pull the team together. It's a difficult piece to bring that leadership together, but in spring you kind of get that bonding. Uh, you know, we'll see that they rebuild that culture of, of Sark doing culture. Was it culture Tuesdays? Culture Tuesdays. I believe, it, I believe you're right about that. And, and so Tuesdays. we'll see as he starts to rebuild that trust within the team. And, and you'll see naturally the guys who come out in, in that scenario. And if they continue to build with bringing in the players that, you know, they want to bring in of that are class guys and culture guys, then that'll be something that Texas is going to be able to handle. But it, it is something that you want to see. You are looking for those reports out of spring training of who's the guys leading the drills, who's the people that are picking people up when they're going down, who's the guys that, you know, are just don't have the quit in them. Those guys that you know can be leaders, that's where you want to see coming out of spring training. It'll be interesting to see if there's sophomores who are becoming it. If an Anthony oh, Hill yeah. starts Anthony, to take exactly. on that real – that role totally in the great. linebacker core because he's the guy at a linebacker right now that you would say if anybody's looking at anybody say this is the guy that's supposed to pick up the the tackle on third down and put us in fourth down it's probably Anthony Hill right now so that's a guy you may be looking at to be a leader is it you know is Manny Muhammad step up into that or Derek Williams do they step up in the secondary and become more leaders do you get one of the running backs CJ Baxter can he get into that role do does Jonte Cook take over that role you know, are, you know what the, the interesting thing you about you bring because you bring up a lot of guys that I mean, if you're a sophomore, you're good enough. You know, if you're good enough, you're old enough. So if you're hey, if you're starting for the and, University of Texas, you know, you're probably good enough. No, exactly right. Yeah, but this is the thing about it, interesting and that you bring up about the stars. And I talked to Coach Shipley about this yesterday. You know, Texas' most prominent, recognizable leaders among Longhorn fans who are actually yeah. in the know. They're paying attention. They're listening to us. They're listening to all the great sites uh, that you can on Texas football does a good job. Inside Texas does a great job. Horns 24 seven. Nobody has as many competent, capable, creative entities covering their program uh, in Texas. No, nobody. I mean, yeah. around the country, Texas, Texas fans are really lucky and Texas fans, they, they support their team. They're really, really dedicated to their team. And that's why you get so many different uh, platforms covering the university of Texas. So if you are in the know, which most Lohan fans are, they're well-informed. Then, you know, that the leadership from Texas, the last three years, at least since Sark has been here, has actually come from guys who are not necessarily the frontline starters. You know, Rojo yeah. was the culture bearer for Texas for the first couple of years, right? He's the guy that actually uh, set the tone of the culture. 
And he's the guy that embodied the culture. He was a walking, like talking, essential embodiment of it, right? An example of it. And the players all respected Rojo. He was not a frontline starter. Beach Bichon was a frontline starter, but all the players respected his sacrifice because he switched positions, his commitment, dedication to the team. This is a guy that stood up and, and called the team meeting after they lost to Texas Tech a couple of years ago and said, No, nah, man, we got to get this team together. We cannot allow it to spiral. You know, he he was that he was was the guy that essentially took it upon his shoulders and although it is a burden for guys he decided no i i, I will be the leader um because he's a former quarterback so he's at a natural leadership position anyway yeah. but i will be the leader i will do it by example whether on the field or in the locker room in the weight room whatever and it did it's something that i think uh, ultimately it really worked i haven't seen it a lot with a lot of teams where a guy was not the front line starter can be that leader like the, the, the key leader and like you said we obviously would like it to be quarterback but quinn wasn't ready for it yet right i mean quinn is yeah. he's not a natural vocal leader he's got to work himself into that and this year the hope is that hey this year it's time for you quinn we'll get into that a little bit when we go behind the burn on curtain and then it was jay witt who also was not a frontline starter yeah but everybody respected his journey as a player that you know he, he his commitment to it he thought about quitting went through all the injuries but this is a guy that was there early because he had to warm up before everybody else because hey man his his body wasn't like everybody else he learned that through three or four years of dealing with all the injuries um so everybody watched him struggle watched, watched him go through trials and tribulations and watched it essentially build his football character and his football character also embodied the culture of texas that play against tcu so everybody will tell you these days long one fans and the, and the players too oh no jay witt jay witt was one of our he's probably our top leaders or he's our he's the guy we look to yeah which is like i said a very strange dynamic you don't see that a lot this year i wonder who it'll be and my man Bob Shipley brought up a very interesting name because they want to continue the trend of it not being a frontline guy, okay. but being a guy everybody respects in that locker room because they watched their journey. Yeah. Is it a Michael Taff? Is it somebody who's in the rotation, but not a mainline guy? And that's that's what Bob Shipley brought up. And I was like, damn, that's 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 good. Yeah. That's a that's a guy that and remember Sark has talked about recruiting football character and recruiting football character from great football programs, even in high school. Why? Because football great football programs like Westlake, they weed out bad football character or they rehabilitate it. You can come in there with a lazy bad attitude, lazy work ethic into Westlake. And if and if you don't change that. You won't be on the field, and they'll end up you know, <laughs> pushing you out of that program. So they push, or pushing you so down on the depth chart, you never see the field, and you're you're irrelevant, right? That's what great football – or or it'll, reha it'll rehabilitate. Re it'll, you know, reinvent your football character, and then you'll become a guy that has great work ethic and an unselfish teammate, and you'll become a guy who focuses and become a guy that stay, that gets there early and stays late, right? It'll change your football yeah, yeah. character. And that's why Sark recruits guys from those types of high schools. He's talked about that. And Michael Taff does fit that. Is there is there anybody in your mind that that fits that pattern? Not a not a starter, not a front line starter, but a guy that gives you relevant reps who the team respects, who could end up being the next culture bearer for Texas. I mean, I, I'll give you one on defense and one on offense. I think David Benda. Oh, that's good. Is one who's a six year no, guy good. who's somebody that could be a guy who's been there that and does. fought his way up to get to that job. But he's Good. been there for a long time, so I put him on Good. defense as somebody there. And then on offense, I'm curious about Savion Red. Because mm. of, of how much work he's put in, because of his transformation from one to the other, depending on what role he has on the team this year, like that, that if he does fall into a more fullback role and get some more snaps that way, if he is the short yardage guy, but if he is this guy who's a wide receiver who's changed position and is 100% bought in, because that's what you need from the guys. That's when you bring up with Taft. That's what you bring with Benda. That's what you bring up with Saving Red. They are 100% bought into what these coaches are coaching them. They are, okay. They're taking it and saying, well, you tell me what I needed to go. You tell me how, to, you know, you say jump, I say how high. Those are the guys. And so I think it's Saving Red I'll bring up because they said, hey, you know what? Let's move you inside and let's try you here. Let's put you under center. Let's try you here. Okay, let's put on some weight. Let's try you here. And he's done all of them, and he's done all of them well. Yeah, yeah. So we'll see what he does. And, you know, we, you know, we've talked about one to see what he looks like and see how he moves with the added weight, see how they use him with the added weight. But if he I, falls into a role that they're using him a little bit more, especially in short yardage, and he becomes an important piece of getting touchdowns, then he could be somebody that is in those third and fourth downs 
when you need the leader on the field, when you need somebody to, to get the team ready, when you need that pep talk to pick up, you know, seven inches to keep a drive going in the fourth quarter, he could be the guy in on that play and be doing it. I love that. I, I, I love both of those. The your Bender one is really interesting yeah. because he's involved essentially in a competition for a spot. Yeah. There aren't many position battles, like straight up old school position battles. Texas is so deep now and they rotate that we're looking at uh, battles for target share, battles for snap distribution. We're looking at, you know, those kind of battles, right? Battles for, you know, running back reps, right? Who's going to get more reps, CJ Baxter or Jaden Blue, probably CJ Baxter, but how are they going to split up and distribute uh, those reps? That's kind of more what we're looking at, right? Defensive tackle rotation. Who's going to be the third or fourth defensive tackle? Um, but one of the old school position battles has to say position that is open and there's an old school competition is the uh, linebacker spot opposite Anthony Hill. And to your point about David Binder, he is one of the guys that, you know, is a, is a favorite to, to win that spot. I think uh, Leon LaFowle is another guy that I think has a really good chance to win that spot opposite Anthony Hill. But David Bender could be a stabilizing force at that linebacker spot. And even if he doesn't start, Getting back to our point about leadership, not necessarily coming from a frontline starter like a Rojo or a Jay Witt, he could be a guy that you need in games like Michigan versus Michigan versus Georgia versus Kentucky when teams want to play power football against you. And maybe the young linebackers who are fit for a more modern game and they don't have the run fit ability, not a forced run defender like a David Bender. And then you ha- you need a David Bender as a change up for teams that want to run power right at you. Um, Because teams are going to run power at Texas, especially if they have these young, not hybrid linebackers, but young, um, speedy, progressive kind of uh, these these linebackers who could be considered kind of modern new age linebackers. You're going to test them to see if they can if they can go old school. You're a new age linebacker. Well, let's see if you can go old school, which just stop power football running right at you. <laughs> um, and I think for young guy, Anthony Hill, that's teams like Michigan and teams like you know, Kentucky, teams like Georgia are going to test that. David Benda is the counter to that. And the young man they brought in from Alabama, uh, Blackshear, I believe yeah. is his name. He's another guy that's going to contend for that spot. So I'm glad you brought that up, David Benda, because he's actually going to be competing for that linebacker position. All right, uh, good discussion there uh, about uh, Texas spring football. We're all excited. We got so many storylines to cover for Texas spring football. We'll get back <laughs> to some of those uh, because behind the burnt orange curtain, Black Stradamus called it, or maybe the football theorist in me called it. Uh, my man Chip Brown has uh, a report that confirms one of my uh, my beliefs about a player on the Texas defense and how he should be utilized and weaponized. And I'm glad Texas is leaning that direction. Maybe his great minds think alike. Maybe they're listening to Rod B. Who knows? We'll get into that. Also, I got some um, I got some advice from my man Quinn Ewers. He's got a you know, this is a big spring for him, period. Uh, but also this week, uh, so aside from Texas spring practices, he's got a really good chance to make a huge impression on all the right people. We'll talk about that when we go behind the burnt orange curtain as well. Uh, we also uh, come back. <clears throat> we'll get the big fat poll today coming up at 645. Don't miss that. My man, Patrick Davis, will come right back. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming right back on the horn.
All right, time to uh, go behind the burnt orange curtain, even though we've been talking a lot of Texas football today because Texas spring football starts on the 40 acres. Uh, hey, man, any excuse that we can talk Texas football, um, we'll use it because <laughs> uh, everybody's excited about uh, the team. Um, it's probably the most anticipated spring football for Texas in, man, maybe 15 years. Uh, I mean, I think you got to go back to like 2000, the late 2000s, 2008, 2009, when there were really high expectations for the team and Lohan fans were confident their team was going to be really good. And they hadn't had a spring where they're confident their team is going to be really good in a long time. I mean, 2018, Texas fans didn't know the team was going to be good and, no. you know, go to a sugar bowl. To I think Last time Texas fans knew their team was going to be good. And expectations were really high in terms of now making the college football playoff. Because I think you got to go back to maybe 2009, 10. I know going after 2009, Longhorn fans had real expectations for 2010 just because they were used to winning double-digit games and going to championships, but losing Cole McCoy and then the transition to Garrett Gilbert, uh, the fall from grace, not even making a bowl game the next year. Texas hadn't had high expectations in the spring, I don't think, since then. Or at least a spring with uh, this type of anticipation. So anyway, a lot of, lot of talk, a lot of buzz about the spring. I saw this report at Horns 24-7, and it got me excited because everybody who's listened to me on any of my platforms, whether it be on Texas football or here on the broadcast, on the Horn, uh, Longhorn Blitz, uh, Third and Longhorn, I've been pretty adamant that the Longhorns need to move Jade Barron around. Like just, uh, I don't think just putting him at nickel um, at times makes it easier to exploit him uh, just within the framework of the defense. Depending on the matchup that week, because he's so versatile, you just move him around. And if you want him to win the Thorpe, he's not going to win the Thorpe. We'll be a finalist for the Thorpe just because, you know, he, he he's a really good player. He is a really good player. He needs you to promote his his skill set and the way you promote Jade Barron's skill set is you promote him as the most versatile defensive back in the country. A yeah. defensive back, essentially what Jabril Peppers was with with Michigan. He's a DB that can play safety. He can play nickel. He can play corner. He can play anywhere you need him to in the secondary. It'll help his draft stock number one. All right, and I know he wants to play corner. I get that because he corners where the big bucks are. Corner's really sexy. So for him, he probably doesn't want to play safety. Nickel and corner are sexier. I remember asking my man Quandre Dix. He played every position in the secondary. Played corner, played nickel, played safety uh, at Texas and in the NFL. And he said his favorite position is nickel just because he likes the action. He's an action junkie. All right, he likes the action of playing nickel because it's never a boring moment. Safety, you can get a little bored back there. Playing center fielder, limiting the explosive plays, coming late to clean up a lot of the action. No, he wants to be in the midst of the action i think jay baron wants to play corner because of the challenge but also that's where the money is it's a premium position if you're going to increase your draft stock corner is the way to increase your draft stock but i, I same thing about my man quandry who played every position in secondary i asked him i said you'll say you like playing nickel but where'd you make all your plays where'd you get all your nfl accolades he said yeah it's safety and i told him i said you know why that makes sense i said because uh, you're a football investigator you are great. I mean, you're not, he's not a physical, Quandre ain't a physical freak. Yeah. He's shorter than your average defensive backs. He's slower than your average defensive backs. Now he's quick. He's as quick or quicker than your average defensive back. Go look at his three cone drill in terms of change of direction, short area quickness. He's awesome there. But where he uh, excels and where he's extraordinary, elite, is his football intelligence. He's from a football family. I've been knowing Quandre since Quandre was like eight years old. He's running around the, the running around Moncrief because his big brother Quinn Jam was who I played with was my my cornerback right teammate, and we he started opposite me. And Quandre was always in the locker room. So Quandre has been around Texas football since he was like eight years old, and he's been around football, high level football like that. And you know what I say about old souls? They're old souls like Quandre who understand the dedication and commitment because they've seen it. All right. They, they've, they've actually seen what it takes. They've actually seen the path. So for them, yeah. it is not foreign. And that's why his football intelligence, like I said, makes him a football investigator. What he does really well is he's able to diagnose clues, whether whether that's uh, the, uh, you know, the down and the distance, whether that's the formation, a personnel package, whether that's the personnel, the person he's playing against because he's watched a lot of film and he knows what their weaknesses and strengths are. He knows what their tendencies and their trends are patterns are in these formations in this situation circumstance whatever it may be and in the 15 to 20 seconds pre-snap just like a quarterback has a pre-snap read so do defenders and he is thin slicing 
and gathering clues so that he can narrow down how the offense is going to attack him. And then by the time the ball is snapped, he's like, all right, they're only going to run one of three plays out of this formation with this personnel grouping in this situation. And he's great at once the ball is snapped in that right split second, he can he he automatically eliminates the other one to two plays, and then he's just defending one play. You can't defend every route on the route tree. You can't defend every play. Great defenders are thin slicing, narrowing down the ways an offense is going to attack you. Now, sometimes you guess wrong. Sometimes you do, right? Sometimes yeah. you're, you're, you miscalculate. But a lot of times he hits because they're just great football players. And, and not everybody. Most coaches have a certain amount of plays they like to run on their, their money plays on certain downs and distances. And they are, they have these tendencies and trends and patterns that develop and players, some players are better than others. They're picking up on My point is when I told Quandre this, and we, we vibed about it and it made sense because when you're at safety, you get more clues because you have better, you have better vision of the entire field of everything happening. And you get a little extra time and an extra half a second, maybe even a little bit more than that to actually diagnose the play and watch it develop at safety. Now, at nickel, you don't have that. Everything happens fast at nickel. Everything close to the bar happens fast. Boom. You're working on instinct most of the time. You're in a quantum realm <laughs> when you're at nickel. You're just going off instincts, boom, and muscle memory. You ain't got time to think. Yeah. And cornerback, and cornerback is just one-on-one. Cornerback is just mano a mano. So we, it's me and you going against each other. I really could care less about everything happening inside. I got to make sure I neutralize this threat defensively. But at safety, you actually have a chance to process, all right, the clues that you're getting. You got, and that's why he got more picks. He made more plays of safety because a great football investigator just needs more clues, and then pretty soon they'll solve the case. And that's why Jade Barron would be a good safety. I heard, uh, I actually read uh, my man uh, Chip Brown had a piece with Gary Patterson a couple years ago saying, yeah, I don't know, I think he could play safety. There are some different coverages depending on the formation and the personnel grouping that they're defending where he ends up essentially playing safety playing a high safety so he can do it and the report from my man chip brown today from horns 24 7 is or at least i think this was two days ago uh so last week basically is that um texas has been cross-training today baron at field safety field corner and star entering spring ball so essentially they're cross-training at every position uh, you know, during spring ball, and they should. You should promote him as the most vers- versatile defensive back. It'll help you because <clears throat> matchup wise, teams won't be able to uh, immediately determine where he is and where he's going to be. So if they're going to attack Jade Barron, which they won't, or stay away from Jade Barron, it makes their job more difficult. It increases his draft stock because versatility is key. All right. And the more you can do, the better chance you have in making an NFL roster. And if he wants to go to corner where it's considered a premium position, he can increase his draft stock there because teams want to see, hey, man, can he just go out there and flat out cover at the cornerback position? And that's the big money position. So there are so many different advantages to moving him around or at least cultivating his versatility. And by the way, this is not a new thing. Coach Akina was always preaching the 5-2 DB when I was on campus. As a matter of fact, you go look, I went tracked because I was looking at versatility. I started thinking about those Denver Broncos and the Denver Broncos have three, uh, three, Texas defenders, actually four Texas defenders, excuse me, on their roster now. Caden Stearns, P.J. Locke, Brandon Jones, and Malcolm Roach. Three of those four played multiple positions on the 40 acres. Think about it. Brandon Jones played nickel and played safety. P.J. Locke played nickel and also played safety. Came in, I think, as a corner out of high school. Um, Malcolm Roach played defensive end, defensive tackle, outside linebacker, B backer, played the Fox position and played middle linebacker for Texas, ends up as a D tackle in the league, played everything. Versus, so it's one thing we do know about Sean Payton's philosophy, he likes versatility. He likes multiplicity. He likes guys that can you can move around the chessboard. And I went, I went back and tracked all the DBs basically since 1999, since I played nickel and corner. All right, at Texas, played multiple positions. How many of them played multiple positions who ended up on an NFL roster, who played multiple positions either at Texas or in the NFL? And out of the DBs that I tracked since 2000, basically, since my man Quentin Jammer, who, I, by the way, was a safety first and then moved to corner and got drafted as a corner, sick, I got over 60% of Texas or around 60% of the Texas defensive backs that either been drafted or even undrafted free agents to make a roster. They played multiple positions at Texas or in the NFL. Multiplicity and versatility. 
it is key, Patrick. It is key because it offers it gives you solutions. The defense essentially is trying to put you at matchup disadvantage. They're trying to make run defenders, pass defenders, trying to make a pass defender, a run defender. This happens in every sport. It happens in basketball, I'm sure, too. There are great examples of yeah. it. And what you want to do in basketball, this is also the case, you want athletes who have a versatile skill set where they're never truly at a huge disadvantage. Even if you put them in a compromising position, they have a versatile enough skill set where if you turn them into a run defender, hey, Quandre Diggs is fine being a run defender. He's like, hey, man, I'm a physical style player. You want to turn him into a guy that's got to cover one-on-one? He can do that too. He can cover one-on-one man-to-man. You want to turn him into a, a defender who's got to operate in space? He can operate in space. That's the key to versatility. It's solutions when the uh, offense presents problems to you versatility is going to offer you solutions yeah i think that's it 100 percent is the what what can you do if there's a problem how do you solve the problem and if you only have one skits skill set like if you're if you're a janitor and you only have a broom how are you going to clean up <laughs> how are you going to clean up when someone spills a drink and, and that's if you if you I love that. <laughs> but if you only have the ability to stop passing and they run on you well you lose all of your games even if you were the best pass defender in the world and they just run, then you just sit on the sideline for no reason because you, you can't learn another thing. So you have to be able to learn to do multiple things because every team is going to try and find it. And, and you know, and now, especially adding in more games to the season, that's more film on you. That's more pieces where everyone's going to try to find the thing. We know that Texas last season and for multiple seasons, it's crossing routes. It's it's you know motion before the snap and and but and group and bunch groups and 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 all of that that they would do and Texas has to keep finding solutions as the season goes on to fight against people who are going to use those things that are poor against them and they, that they have problems with. So if Texas can have more versatile people, then you can solve those problems within a game. You can solve those problems within a series. You can solve those problems quicker and quicker the more versatile the players you have versus well hey we have to go back to practice this game's a loss we have to go back to practice and figure out how to stop this the more you have versatility before the game the more you can imply uh, and implement it in the game yep i mean it, it's that's what it's really about and i this is not a i don't think this is something that's an outlier for texas just with your day parent i think this is the future guys I think they're they're kind of going retro back to when Coach Akini came on campus and Coach Akini said, going up against the air raid, listen, first of all, I need four guys on the field that can straight up cover. If you can't cover, I'm sorry, you can't play safety in my defense, which is why the safeties ended up being Nathan Basher and Ahmad Brooks, two guys who were cornerbacks. Cornerbacks who could tackle really well in space. And Coach Akini said, they're cornerbacks who can tackle really well in space. They played offense and defense in high school, which means they got a really high football IQ. That's another thing about a player who plays multiple positions. You can't play multiple positions without having a high football IQ because I need you to learn what other guys on the defense are doing. I need you to learn what the cornerback position has to do in terms of the fundamentals and the technique and the coverages. Uh, also, I'm going to need you to learn what the nickelback has to do, and they're all totally different, and learn what safety's got to do. High football intelligence, high football IQ. That's something it tells you. But this is not a new thing. When Coach Akina came in defending the air raid, he said, I need guys taking cover. So he put corners at safety position. All right. And then put two two corners. And uh, by the way, I played nickel my first year. And Quinn Jam was a safety and put us at corner. He essentially had four cornerbacks on the field. Yeah. And so when you face the air raid offense, which was trying to exploit your safeties in coverage by putting Wes Welkers of the world in the slot <laughs> and something that no most teams weren't doing back then. Hell, we could come, we could match up with it. Cause like, all right, nasty Nate, Nathan Vash, go down there and cover that slot, man. You know you can do it. We we got the athletes to do it. All right. Mod Brooks can do it because he's a guy that played corner. So he was not uh, out of his comfort zone having to be put in a situation where you're one-on-one -on -one against an elite athlete in space. So it's not a new thing. It's actually kind of retro idea. And I wonder if Blake Gideon is the one telling them, hey, man, we need more versatility. That's the guy that lived it. He was there in the coach of Kingdom secondary and understood what the 5-2 DB was all about. A guy that can do everything. The guy that can tackle. A guy that can play man. A guy that can play zone. A guy that can blitz. All right, A guy that has ball skills. All those things. And you go look at the uh, recruiting class Texas brought in, right? The DB was obviously a focus. It seems like they were they were overhauling the secondary. And finally, in terms of roster construction, they wanted to build the secondary through this recruiting class. And also they brought in Makuba uh, via transfer report. That's, that's six guys. When I counted, I went back and looked at the amount of times that Sark used the term versatile, versatility, or um, implied it by some other term. 
when he talked about Kobe Black, he said he's a versatile player and he's a three-position player. Um, Makuba was described as versatile by Sark. Dabble Sweeney actually said Makuba can play any position in the secondary too. Uh, Jordan Johnson Rubel was described by Sark as a position flex guy and a versatile defender. Santana Wilson was described as a versatile defender with versatility in his skill set. The only guy he actually didn't, uh, and by the way, this was the my my favorite quote from uh, Sark on his recruiting um, media availability on signing day. He said, quote, all RDBs all have the ability to play coverage and play man coverage, whether they end up at safety, star, or corner. He's telling you. He's already telling you guys, I'm recruiting versatility. I don't know where these guys are going to end up. Yeah. I don't know. But I, I, I need – number my number one priority is can you cover? Can you cover? Because now i got good players in my secondary. Last year, Texas had good football players who, who, who were coverage liabilities. They weren't coverage specialists. So now I'm going to have good football players in my secondary, but they all going to be able to cover. Yeah. That was the key to the reinvention of DBU when I was there. There wasn't a guy in that, in that, that secondary that couldn't cover. Now, there were guys that couldn't tackle. There were guys <laughs> that didn't have great uh, football IQ. There were guys who weren't great at film study. There were guys who didn't diagnose and process really well in the pre-snap. Uh, there were guys who didn't get out of their breaks quick enough. There, there were guys who had issues. We all, nobody was perfect. I mean, Huff Daddy was pretty damn close. Uh, you know, nobody was perfect in that secondary. But we all could cover. And that's what they started recruiting. I think now Texas is getting back to, we're just going to recruit guys that can cover. We'll find out what position they're going to play later on. But if you can't cover, then you can't play here. Coverage specialists. You, you recruit what you cannot coach. You can't coach coverage. That's what they're recruiting. And you can't coach. You, I don't think you can coach versatility. I think that's also something that guys come in with with a versatile skill set. And then when you can you can cultivate it. I think, but I don't know if you can coach it. So I think that's what Texas is going in the future. I think they're going toward versatility. Uh, it's something I've been championing for a while. I don't know if they're listening to me, listening to Blake Gideon, or great minds think alike, but either way, I applaud it. Good <laughs> stuff. There you go. Um, all right, I want to give uh, some advice to Quinn, but we'll save that to the next Rod rant. We got so many spring football storylines to get to. It's exciting. What's also exciting is the big fat poll of the day, which is coming up next with my man Patrick Davis. We'll also reveal the musically themed day of the week, also one of my favorites too. So don't go anywhere. We're coming right back. The Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming right back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Lohan, Rod Babers here. We love Austin, aside from the traffic. It's a great city. And as the city continues to grow and thrive, so do our friends at Iron Workers Local Union 482. Many of the iconic landmarks that we love in this city actually were created by the hands and the skilled craftsmanship of Iron Workers Local Union 482, like the Pennybacker Bridge and the DKR Stadium. Um, and the folks over at Iron Workers Local 482 right now are uh, in the middle of a huge project. Um, and right now, you could be a member of Iron Workers Local 482. They're hiring over 3,000 people for this big project. They're happening right here in Central Texas. They're offering competitive wages, competitive benefits, and a pension plan. They even offer training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program. So right now, it's a great opportunity for you to become a member of Iron Workers Local 482 and take pride in the type of teamwork and craftsmanship that helps shape the future of our great city. Iron Workers Local 482 don't go to the office. They build it. So if you're looking for an exciting employment opportunity or a refreshing career change, how about becoming a member of Iron Workers Local 482? Uh, and right now is the perfect time for you to do it. Maximize your potential and accept the challenge of becoming the best version of yourself by applying online today at ironworkers482.org. That's ironworkers482.org.
Back on the broadcast on a Tuesday morning, and it is a top of the charts Tuesday where we play uh, number one hits on this day in history, going all the way back to uh, the 60s on this one, and then we'll pull it back into modern day, uh, playing top of the chart songs all day here on a Tuesday as we get ready for NCAA tournament action, getting ready for uh, the first four games that will start tonight. And so that leads us to our big fat poll today. Text line is open. 512-447-3776. Patrick's Big Fat Poll of the Day on the Horn. Big Fat Poll of the Day today. We know one of the best part about the NCAA tournament is the Cinderella's, is the underdogs. It is the, the challenge to see who will come out. That's why you fill out your brackets to see who will pull out the big victories, who will pull off the upsets. And it leads us to our question today, which is not going to be the best teams, the best underdog teams, the best Cinderella's. It's going to be who's your favorite underdog in sports as a person. Let's we'll start with a person. We may do a couple of these this week. But who's your favorite underdog in sports as a person? So we can look at examples like Kurt Warner. Hmm. It's a guy who was bagging groceries, couldn't make it in the NFL, and then all of a sudden becomes an MVP and a Super Bowl champion. Jose Altuve who was uh, in Venezuela, they they kicked him out of the, the tryouts the first time because they didn't believe how old he was. He said he couldn't make it. It's like 5'5". Five, five. He yeah, was he was bathing in a in the river mm-hmm. by the house. They didn't have indoor plumbing where he lived wow. and wins an MVP in two World Series. That is it Muggsy Bogues, who's 5'3", and had a career in the NBA. Or, you know, maybe, maybe it's over in the world of boxing or something. It's someone like Buster Douglas, who is the biggest underdog upset of all time yeah it is yeah that was but yeah it, it could be i guess that could be your favorite underdog but man, it, it wouldn't my be my favorite underdog would have to be somebody that actually like a lot of people like brock purdy because he's yeah. really relevant now he's kind of a really popular underdog I, I don't know how it's not tom brady i mean he was drafted in a six we just we forget this because it was so long ago because this is <laughs> this is what i'll say it's not but he rose to prominence to be the goat after being drafted in the sixth round, there, there's a couple reasons. That's One, the reason that he rose that because he has that chip on his shoulder. He does because he believes he was the ultimate underdog. I and I get that. I, I'll put this on, and it's still one reason is because I don't like Tom Brady. But I know you don't. I respect him, <laughs> but I don't like him. The other is he was drafted to the NFL. If you were drafted the NFL, I, if you were drafted, I'm not going to count you as an underdog. It's such a select group of people who get drafted. It's such a small group of people. If so you said Brock Purdy can't be an no, underdog either. No, but he's a four-year he, starter he at Iowa State. He was a four-year starter at a Power yeah. Five school. I, I'm saying guys that did not necessarily go to the biggest school, didn't go, didn't weren't drafted in the NFL, and then made it, or you know, had to find other ways to prove that they were good enough to be able to play in that situation. Tom Brady yeah. went to Michigan and couldn't get the starting job. And then came to New England and worked his butt off and got there. I get it, but I'm not going to give. He wasn't under. He was. So you're saying can't can't go to a big time blue blood program and can't be drafted. I'm saying, saying I'm saying can't go. So you're underdog. I'm, I'm just saying I don't consider that an underdog. Is boy that that guy who went to Michigan? Wow, what a hard life he had to lead to go to a to one of the best schools in the world, and then and then got drafted. One of the few select people in the world to get drafted okay. in the NFL. I, he never had a shot. No, no I get you, but he, I mean, he is considered an underdog. People, I, that I get that, that you know, underdog story because, because Boston people want to say that they're underdogs themselves. And so they love okay. the theory that he is an underdog. But he, okay. I, I, I get you can say he's an underdog consi- you know, compared to the number one overall pick. So comparatively, he's an underdog. But to Kurt Warner, he is not. Okay. Because Kurt Warner did not go to a major school. Kurt Warner was not drafted in the NFL. Kurt Warner was not in any of those bases. And so you say he is not. So if you're saying an actual underdog, I would say it's somebody who is, who has actually had to overcome more odds than I'm not the starter. That is the one odds that Tom Brady had to overcome was he was not the starter. He was never even third string. Mm, So I'm not going to say, well, what a tough life he had to leave as a backup at Michigan and in the Patriots. For okay. four years of his life, what a hard All life! Right. <laughs> no, no, I get, I get you. So I, I, I just want, I, I just want to give Tom Brady. I, I, I can't, the dog. I I can't tell give you him. Hate, you hate Tom Brady. I, I, I hate <laughs> the fact that he is considered this guy who one overcame one all the odds. When you're like, no, he was given a lot. Like he was, he's very talented. He had a lot of things. He did work his butt off. He is the goat. 
I'm not going to take that away from him, but let's not pretend that he's five foot two and was born without a leg. And the guy, he, he didn't know even how to, he didn't even have an arm to throw the ball with until he was 48 oh, yeah. years old. That's, it feels uh-huh. like he gets, he gets more credit because people want to create this legend of him that he came from nothing. He was at Michigan and he did start. He just lost the starting job. He just couldn't keep the starting job. Yeah. Which, you know, that's, that kind of feeds into the underdog thing. It's like he was never even the main starter there at Michigan. But I get you. Hey, I get you. No, no, no. All right. A big <laughs> fact poll today. Uh, Patrick wants to know who's the ultimate underdog for you in sports. Uh, and he's got some stipulations on it. So don't say Tom Brady. I'll throw that out there. Tom Brady, not considered the underdog for my man, Patrick. All right. We come back. We'll hear from an underdog of a franchise, at least recently, uh, the Houston Texans, who have now shown uh, that they may become a big dog in the NFL pretty soon we'll hear from nick casario the gm of the texans we'll also get into some talk about the dallas cowboys they did make a move uh i told you they started making moves at the end of free agency and the cowboys did make another move so we'll talk about that tyron smith pins a farewell letter uh for the cowboys fans out there uh rog rant coming up on the other side as well all of that and more when we return this is the broadcast featuring patrick patrick davis i'm lifetime on rod babers coming right back on the horn
All right. Welcome back to the Rodcast. It is a top of the charts Tuesday. That's when the idea you know, my co-host Patrick Davis, he comes up with the uh, musically themed days of the week. But top of the charts Tuesday is when he plays jams from uh, bands who had a a uh, best a uh, what man top of the charts Tuesday number one is when number one hit on this day yes. in history. I thought I, I was gonna. It's weird. I get my musically themed days <laughs> mixed up. I apologize. But yes, <clears throat> like number one hit on this day in history. For top of the charts Tuesday. Uh, thanks, to my man Patrick. Also for the big fat poll of the day. Um, Patrick wants to know the ultimate underdog for you in sports. Yes. Period. We're going all time here. Your right? favorite, your matter, favorite, your you know, favorite underderdog. Like I was saying, I go, Tony Romo's were a couple up there. Tony Romo, undrafted Tony Romo is a great Eastern underdog. Illinois, and then so he came out and you say, okay, he's a starter and done that, and it's, it definitely could be your favorite because if you're a Cowboys fan, you love the Romo era, then then that'll be your favorite. Yeah, Romo is a great underdog, actually. Uh, a lot of you know, Romo. I love me some Romo, but Cowboys fans, I, they were pretty much split on Romo. They're split on Dak too. Cowboys fans, they never. I guess Troy Aikman may have been the last quarterback that all of the Cowboys fans, or at least the majority of them, all support. I, I mean, I, I never met a Troy Aikman hater, but I meet Dak haters all the time, and I meet Romo haters, and I imagine it's just because obviously they don't compete for championships. Um, do, you, do you know there's Troy Aikman yeah. haters now because statistically and like award wise, he just didn't really do that much. So like, oh, it, it oh really? okay. So there okay. are haters now because they but didn't necessarily oh. come in the era. So they now look back on it and say, well, he like he was a he never was he was, in the, a, he was a game manager. Yeah, he never he was never all pro. Yeah. He was never you know he made the Pro Bowl yeah. six times, but he was never like the greatest. So if he was never the greatest, then how could he be thought of as great? But you're like he won three Super Bowls, and you had him yeah, Smith. Exactly. So you have to. Yeah. So I think if you were if you remember watching it, then he was. If you don't remember watching it, then I could see if you just look at the paper and you go, "Well, Dan Marino was much better than him." <laughs> you yeah. know. You no, know what I mean? no, I, no. It's quarterback is so interesting because I heard someone say this. I thought it was pretty interesting that it is easily the most important and the most valuable position in football. Um, and it is a position that can elevate everybody else on the football field. Um, but also it is one of the only positions in football that needs everybody else yeah. around them in order for them to succeed. Now, you know what I mean? Like, yeah, he needs the wide receivers to play well. He needs the blocking of the offensive line. He needs all those things to be working really well, or at least at a competent level for him to succeed. Um, so it is. It's weird in terms of a hey, should wins and losses be all on the quarterback? Hey, as Vy once told me, you get all the girls, you get all the grief. It's okay. All right, don't be worried about quarterbacks, man. They're fine. <laughs> they get a lot of love uh, in yes. the football world. So they, it, that's that's why they get the burden of it, but they get a lot of benefits too. So it's okay. Uh, matter of fact, we'll talk about that with Quinn because uh, Quinn's in. I think a really interesting situation this week. Of course, the start of spring ball. This is going to be his team, by the way. All right. He hadn't, that hadn't really been the case. I think last year, you know, you had still, we talked about all the leadership you had on that team last year. You know, you had guys on defense like a Jalen Ford and like a, a Byron Murphy, you know, veteran guys. Uh, on Dale Tavondre Sweat, I guess, also considered a veteran guy. You had on offense, you had that wide receiving core, X Man. Uh, you know, Jay Witt was a great leader for that team, too. No question about it. Christian Jones uh, showed some great leadership. I remember hearing a story from Jerry Hamilton over at On Texas Football that last spring when they were just out there observing, um, you know, because they go out there early for the media sessions, which they're invited to. And uh, they just want to get to see, you know, see the players come in and get to see them warm up and all that kind of stuff. And he said the, the group that used to come out there early were the wide receivers. They'd be out there early, way before everybody else, getting work in before uh, the practices. As it, it really kind of X Man, um, Ad Mitchell, Jay Witt, and the group, and it just shows you that is there's a there's a certain mentality uh, with leadership. Once you once you feel like you have that burden, that you have to set the example. And I remember being that player, like, no, this is right. This is this is my secondary now. Quinn Jam yeah. is gone. Amari Brooks is gone. Like I got to step up. I got to set the example. And the example is every day your habits 
being kind of high level habits, getting there early, you know, staying after to put the work in, you know, making sure that you're organized enough that everybody's, you know, watching film, that everybody has that. Everybody's got their own schedule, too, because they got a class and everything. And make sure you guys set aside time as a group to y'all can watch film together, um, that you are bonding as a group, too, because that's important. I think that matters. I think Texas rotates a little too much on defense. Sometimes it hurts the chemistry uh, of a group. I mean, we as a, we were one of the best secondaries in the country. We played together a lot. We had a lot of reps together. And we were hive minded because I knew what Nathan Vasher and Ahmad Brooks was going to be thinking on that coverage in this situation against that twin uh, against twins on the uh, boundary side when they ran a double post. I knew how he would play it because I he plays it the same way every time. All right, so I was able to adjust to that. And I, I think at times when you're rotating a lot of guys in the secondary, sometimes you have issues getting that that chemistry, that hive minded yeah. mentality together. But you, you got to spend time together to do that. My point is the leadership on the team has to step up right now during spring and assert itself. And you got to do it by example, and you got to do it off the field. We talked about that too. So um, obviously a lot of storylines coming out of spring ball at Longhorn fans are excited. We're excited too. Uh, we'll get you your horn headlines. That'll be coming up here momentarily. We'll also get you some sound from Nick Casario, the GM, oh, sorry, Nick Cook Casario, the GM of the Houston Texans. Uh, a lot of people gave him that nickname because uh, he, he is making a lot of moves or trying to make a lot of moves in free agency. Uh, we'll also talk about the Cowboys, Rico Dowdle re-signing with them. Uh, that's uh, big news. I mean, I know look, Cowboys fans want bigger news, but that's as big as it gets. Rico Dowdle re-signing. Sorry, Cowboys fans. <laughs> Just reporting what we got. Um, and we'll get into that. Uh, we'll also go uh, into Rod's rather day next segment. Uh, talk uh, the the NFL's big issue right now, the, their glaring problem. Um, and they don't have a lot of big problems. And I don't know if this is a big one, but it's certainly one that has become a huge topic of discussion with the NFL draft coming up. And quarterbacks, uh, I believe, projected to go one, two, and three in the draft, which I believe was the fourth time that's happened in modern uh, draft history where the quarterbacks are going one, two, and three. Um, uh, some it'll be Caleb Williams first, but I think it'll be Jaden Daniel second, and I think it'll be Drake May third. But that could switch up. Drake May could go second, and then Jaden Daniels will go third. Uh, never know, but that's the projection. So we'll get into that and why only one of those guys, based on recent history, is probably going to hit, and the other two are probably going to miss. This yeah. is the reality of the quarterback evaluation and quarterback development right now in the NFL. All right, uh, let's get to the Horn headlines first, and then we'll come back and talk about the Cowboys move. We'll hear from Nick Casario. Uh, he actually is talking about his trade with Minnesota on 16. was talking about to Patrick's idea about trading back up into the draft. So great minds think alike. He said, oh, we can trade back into the draft. So he was already thinking about that, Patrick, when you brought it up uh, the day we had, we talked about that trade or reported that trade. Um, and he also talks about free agency. He talks about how excited he is about the defensive line. There's one player he really likes. And honestly, he was one of the kind of less recognizable, less heralded free agent uh, acquisitions uh, for the Texans. But you should hear Nick Casero talk about this Dude, I'm going to be watching this dude now because he must be a dude the way Casario is talking about him. Anyway, we'll get to that. Uh, but first, let my man Patrick inform you, educate you, and entertain you with the Horn Headlines. Hey, right, Horn Headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Texas baseball starts a two-game miniseries tonight against the Air Force Academy Falcons. This will be the third year in a row that teams play in an early series matchup with Texas being up 2-1 to one in those meetings. Texas will send Grant Fontenot to the mound, who threw for three innings, only allowing one hit in his last outing. In the MLB, the reigning National League Cy Young winner Blake Snell signed a deal yesterday with the San Francisco Giants. The two-year deal is reportedly for $62 million and ends in extended free agency for the ace. The Houston Astros have been in conversations with Snell. However, they could not come close enough to Snell's demands and will continue to search for more starting pitching. And the NCAA tournament begins tonight with two of the first four matchups trying to make it to the field of 64. Two 16 seeds, Wagner and Howard, will kick off the action at 540 with the winner moving on to face North Carolina. And then roughly 10, 8, 10 tonight, Colorado State will take on Virginia in a matchup to take the 10 seed against Texas on Thursday. And that is your Horn Headlines. All right. Thank you, Patrick, for the Horn Headlines. 
Uh, let's get right to some uh, NFL discussion here. Uh, we'll come back to Texas spring football. Uh, we'll go behind the burn orange curtain next hour. Um, we'll start off talking about some of the uh, Texas spring football storylines. But Nick Casario was on 610, um, and Nick Cook Casario, as the <laughs> uh, Texans fans have uh, started to call him because of all the moves he's making. I did do the research, and Nick Casario has – made more NFL transactions than any other GM in the NFL since he took over. I thought that was the case, just yeah. just looking at it, because I don't think anybody's been as busy as the Texans. Because remember, the Texans had a lot of – they had more injuries than anybody else in the league too. That's true, yeah. So they made a lot of moves just because of the injuries. They were just bringing in guys, releasing guys, cutting guys, putting guys on the IR – putting guys on a practice squad. So I remember all those moves and things to myself, damn, I, I keep up. I, I watch them like every week and I'm like, nobody has as many, nobody's making any moves as the Texans are making. So I think that also is the case. And remember, they executed more trades than any other team in the 2023 draft. Remember, they would trade more than any other team. I think they had eight trades or something like that. The Texans executed more trades than any team in the NFL since hiring Casario, including a franchise record eight trades during the 2023 NFL draft. So they he's traded more than any other uh, yeah. GM in the NFL, and I can say I bet transaction wise, you're looking at just transactions. I, I I bet they are at the top of the list of teams with the most transactions too. So that's why he's under the nickname Nick Cook Serio because he's always cooking up something in the kitchen. Remember he tried to trade for Keenan Allen, didn't work out. Um, but this uh, cut is about Nick uh, Casario's philosophy on free agency. Um, because a lot of people are saying right now the Texans have won NFL free agency, or at least they're winning NFL free agency, one of the teams uh, that seems to be uh, knocking it out of the park. Um, and uh, they wanted to know, well, what's your philosophy on free agency, especially now with the Texans championship window wide open? Here's Nick Casario on 16. Really started in January as we started to go through the free agent process. It's not too dissimilar to what we do with the draft. You start with a large pool of players and you pare it down to a, I would say, realistic number, a workable number for your team that if you have the opportunity to add those players to your team, you're going to consider them. So you kind of group them accordingly based on their role. And then the big part is valuing a player. What, what does the market say the value of that player is? You're willing to pay X dollars for whatever play, whatever you think the player is worth. Now, that doesn't mean there's not going to be competition. So you're kind of subject to the marketplace as well. So I think the big thing is just being prepared, being disciplined, and just going through the process and not getting too fixated on one particular position or one particular player and then start to make decisions that are emotional in nature. You, you sort of have to take the emotion out, and you sort of have to take a very pragmatic, um, diligent, rational approach, and you just kind of keep the dialogue moving. And, you know, hopefully we were able to add some players that will be able to help our team here um, the, this upcoming season. I'd say free agency sometimes a little bit like the draft when there's a immediate reaction relative to, draft grades, free agency grades, what happened. And I think we we all just have to take a step back. And, you know, a lot of that stuff will unfold once the season starts. So we're certainly excited about the players that we had the opportunity to add to our team. By the same token, we lost some players that had a significant impact on the Houston Texans, not only this past year, but in previous seasons as well. But that's the nature of the NFL. But overall, <clears throat> I think we're pleased with how the process went. We're pleased and, and certainly grateful for the efforts of so many people in our building. There you go. Casario talking about his philosophy on free agency, essentially saying we treat it like the draft. And we just, and he doesn't get fixated on a particular player or position. He talked about not making emotional decisions. And I, he, if he was just throw in, hey, man, we're just looking for the best value overall the positions that's probably would have would hit the you know the uh the trifecta for me if you will um because i i do think nick casario has done a really good job in talent acquisition i think he's done a decent a really good job in the draft um and i think he's done a, a good job in free agency here so far for the texans too with a lot of money to spend um one thing that also uh was a big topic of conversation earlier this week was his trade or at least last week i think it happened man, did it happen friday that trade with Minnesota, it was uh, oh, yeah, yeah. at the end of last. Yeah, I think it was the end of last week. He they traded out of the first round 
to with Minnesota. Minnesota gets an extra first round pick of the Texans first round pick, which is 23rd overall pick. And uh, they get an extra second round pick in 2024 and another second round pick in 2025. Uh, a lot of the Texans fans, they didn't like this move and they thought Nick Casario uh, may have been, you know, maybe a little bit too anxious uh to to you know making a move like that about the draft when he could have just stayed at 23 and potentially maybe traded down during the draft or at the draft like why make that move in minnesota now um he talks about his reasoning um and what went what went through his mind and actually what was his thought process in making the trade with minnesota here is nick casario we try to be pretty open-minded and pretty progressive in our thinking and just we're always evaluating um, information and evaluating situations. So I'd say the way we were positioned prior to the trade, we were picking a 23, then we were picking a 59, then we had kind of a late third and the two fourths. Um, and you have discussions during the course of, I'd say this time of year, I don't want to say you talk to every team, but you kind of talk to every team, whether it's about players. So as an example, with the trades that were done, you know, we did a few trades, other teams done a few trades. So you're always kind of talking. And then you also have discussion potentially about the draft, about positioning. You know, we had the trade that took place last year between Chicago and Carolina. So different teams are at different stages and there's going to be different dialogues about different things. So, um, we received a, a few calls um, about that pick, and then, you know, we had a conversation with Minnesota about their situation, so we kind of went back and forth, and we looked at the information, and D'Amico and I, and again, we talk about everything, so no decisions are made in a vacuum, so every situation that comes up, we look at everything in totality, we look at everything from a top-down perspective and make sure we understand the ramifications of whatever decisions that we make, um, and so based on the discussions that we had and then based on the discussions that we had with Minnesota, when that opportunity was presented, we felt it made, it made sense for us. So we've talked about this on the show as well. The draft is, <laughs> there's nothing more inexact probably out there than the draft. Mm -hmm. So some of this is really just about positioning um, and potentially pools of players or clusters of players. So let's call it, you're picking 23. So probably anywhere from 25 to 40, you're going to probably have a very similar type of player or you don't know exactly who is going to be. But I would, I would say our college staff has done a phenomenal job. We've met multiple times. We could sit here today right now and maybe have an idea of if we had a pull, X number of players who was going to be available at those spots, you know, would we have players that we feel comfortable with? Probably the answer is yes. But by the same token, if we were to move out of that, like what's the opportunity cost of moving out of that pick? So, you know, moving back 19 spots or whatever it is to the top of the second round there in the 40s. And I would say when you go back and, you know, you, you, you can find good football players all throughout the draft. Yep. So. When you go back specifically to, let's call it that area, you know, over the last few years, you know, guys like Petrie, Maffe, Brisker, you know, even last year, Laporta Mayor, mm -hmm. you know, Bergeron, Musgrave, Branch. Yeah, I, you can tell. Okay, so he's, you can kind of read between the lines there. Um, but Patrick, it sounds like he's saying we only got 20 first round grades yeah. somewhere around there. He talked about the clusters of players, and he talked about from anywhere from 25 to 40, they're the same types of players we believe are going to foul there in terms of the, the impact they're going to have, the overall grade we have these guys on the big board. They're going to be the same type of player. We don't believe that an elite player is going to fall there um, it, with the draft that they're predicting. So trade down is what he's saying because we don't have first-round grades on those players is what I'm reading between the lines. Trade down – where yes, you can you can get a better value overall um, in the second round because you'll have players on your board who are graded out as second round picks or graded out potentially as picks who are you know better value than what you would find as a what you graded out as a second round pick in the first round, which is where you're picking at 23. He's essentially saying at 23, we don't believe a first round talent is going to be available to us. We're going to drop down, acquire more draft capital for dropping down in that trade with Minnesota, and then we'll get the talent that is graded out as second rounders in the second round instead yeah. of overpaying for that talent. Yeah, and I mean, it's the, I mean, if I if I can only, if I'm drafting a wide receiver, for example, and if I'm only going to be able to get, at best, a second wide receiver, I can't get a wide receiver one, I can get a wide receiver two. With two second round picks, I can get a wide receiver two and a DB two. So I can get two players now. 
that are both yep. going to play for me. They're both going to be there. and They're both going to add value. And I could have gotten a slightly better wide receiver too. And even then, he may not be better. You know, he may, he may, he may not, may not. So even if I want to draft two wide receivers in the next two years, and I could draft two guys, and if one of them works out and one doesn't, well, now I have better odds of one of them working out because I have two guys. It just yep. makes more sense because you're. It's not like you're just trading back and that's it. You get another pick out of it. You get another guy. So more draft capital. yeah, I mean, it's it, more draft capital if you want to make a trade, and it's just more people that you're going to be able to build through the draft, build through the cheaper option, be able to fill out your roster, have depth for a team that has had so many injuries that you want to have more depth on that team and having more picks. It could be better than you know just taking another guy where you know you look at like Meiji. He's been fine, but you know he had a, he's had his you know his health issues, and then you know he's come back and maybe he'll be able to pick it up this year, maybe not, but it, you know that's not you. It's nothing's a sure thing, so that twenty three pick that twenty third pick is not a sure thing. I think you know if Texans fans maybe still are thinking of things as if the Texans should get a you know how they've been picking the last few years getting a top five top ten pick, then you think well yeah you're going to be able to get someone really good in that first round. But the reality is, if you look at picks 20 through 30 the last couple of years, unless you're trying to find, unless you find that position, like maybe a quarterback like a Patrick Mahomes that could fall down or, or when they got Deshaun Watson late in the first round, those are rare. What you're more likely going to get is a position where they are in need of a DB and there's already three off the board and those are the three they liked. Yep. No, I, I think that they basically probably got 20, maybe 21. Yeah first round grades and they believe and think about this guys there's more guaranteed money when you draft the guy in the first round you got to pay them like they're first rounders if you don't have them valued as a first rounder why would you want to pay that guy then he's not gonna potentially outperform his contract which you want everybody on your team to do that's how you get value out of that contract so it makes perfect sense that if you don't have you don't believe that a first round pick is going to be available for you in your grades, a first rounder, then trade out, get into the second round, half the guaranteed money. It's cut in half. As soon as you get to the second round, that's those guys get half the guaranteed money that first rounders do. So you're automatically getting a great value. And then you can kind of rely on the incompetence of other organizations where a good player might drop down to you. Yeah. Um, and and if I mean, it doesn't, at least you got those guys graded out as actual second round picks in terms of what you're what you're paying for yeah and, and if you have first round grades on positions that you're not necessarily going to draft like an edge or uh, a quarterback and those are first round grades and you have 25 first round grades but a bunch of them are edges that you don't really want right now because you just paid for an edge and you have an edge in will anderson and you're not taking one in the first round this year then you can say well they're, they're first round talents but we don't we don't necessarily we don't need them so the guys that we yeah. want are going to be gone and if they're not We've talked about it. You can trade right back up and go get them. As a matter of fact, Nick Casario uh, says that in this interview. We have this cut, too. We have this ready, Patrick, that um, he, just like you said, the, the day we reported that trade, um, you said people shouldn't freak out about this because you can just trade back up into the uh, the first round. If you like a guy, you see something developing. Uh, Nick Casario said the same thing. Here he is on 16. D'Amico and I had throughout the course of the week and specific to this mm -hmm. situation, If we stay at 42, which I'm sure you guys can put some DraftKings betting odds on that, whether or not we're going to stay at 42. <laughs> but if we happen to stay at 42, we're hopeful that we're going to be able to find good football player, a good football player or two that can help our football team. So I'd say a big part of the discussion as well was getting the future second round picks. So anytime that you can acquire picks in future years, it just creates a little bit more flexibility and optionality for your team and organization. So when you take all the information on face value, you know, in the end, we felt comfortable with the decision that we were making. Um, does it maybe potentially eliminate a certain pool of players? Potentially, but it doesn't mean we can't come back into the first round. It doesn't mean that's going to be good players available to pick. I would say we've sort of run the gamut here organizationally in terms of, of draft, I would say picks and or compensation from 21 to not having a first and second round pick to 22. We had a little bit more flexibility. You know, 23, we had some flexibility and we traded up, I would say, to the top of the draft. So, Every year is different. I think we just try to be as open-minded and flexible as possible, but also be responsible and just not make decisions to make decisions. But the discussions that D'Amico and I had throughout the course of the week and specific to this situation, we both felt comfortable. And so in the end, 
you know, we made a decision that we felt made the most sense for us and we'll kind of keep moving forward. So you know, saying, yeah, they can trade back into the uh, first round if they need to. Uh, Texans also have new uniforms. Patrick, did you see the new uniforms the Texans have? I saw, I think this? I didn't see all of them, but I saw a couple pictures. Like I saw the picture of uh, yeah. the wide receiver stuff. They're all right. They're nothing. They're all right. Yeah. I agree. They're, they're, they're all right. not anything where it's not getting me super pumped. I'm not going to the store and buying one, but I wasn't anyway. But I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a, uh, yeah, I'm I'm not a Jersey that. guy. I mean, they're but, okay. Yeah, they're all right. I'm with you. I'm not a Jersey guy either, but uh, they're, I mean, they're okay. They're not like really cool or anything. I mean, they're yeah. just, I, I think they wanted, I think they wanted to rebrand themselves. This is an organization that um, went through a lot of turmoil from when, you know, the ori uh, original owner passed away and his son really wasn't ready uh, to be the owner of the team. Cal McNair, I think finally he has stepped up and made some really good decisions lately. They, they thought they found their franchise quarterback. You know, the prince that was promised turned out to be the devil in disguise with the son Watson um, had to hire Casario and the first Casario, I think, I don't know if he struggled, but he, 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 he made two, two hires with two one and done coaches in a row, which usually that smell that spells disaster for a franchise. Uh, but they got it right with D'Amico Ryan's after the two one and done coaches uh, that they had before that. So they started out a little bit shaky, but I'll admit now, I think they, they want to kind of something to symbolize and signify the rebirth of the franchise and the, yeah. the uniforms, new coach, new uh, face of the franchise, new quarterback. I think that it's, it's it for them. It's more symbolic even though I accept the uniforms to me, they're not that much better, but they, I feel it. I'm all, yeah, I'm all about the, the old, the old uniforms were not iconic uniforms either. So it's not something where you're like, man, I can't believe we're losing that. So exactly. it's not, it's not anything. You just go, okay, cool. New uniforms. I, I think also there's a point where they said, you know, we sold a bunch of CJ Stroud jerseys. Let's go sell some more CJ Stroud jerseys. <laughs> that's always a good idea. That's we, all, that's we have marketable stars. Now we sold them for a year. Let's sell them again. Yeah. Yeah, we lost a lot of money with the Deshaun Watson buybacks. Yeah, uh, so we've let's... still got we've got, <laughs> we've got warehouses full of these. Yeah, we got to still. Yeah, we're just getting them jerseys back. And I remember that in the Deshaun Watson buyback program. Uh, okay, uh, we we didn't get to the Cowboy stuff. We'll get to that a little bit later on. They did sign Rico Dowdle. I want to throw that out there. Uh, Rico Dowdle signed with the Cowboys on a one-year deal uh, worth $1.2 million. So they do have a running back now. That's good. They do finally have a running back. Uh, Tyron Smith uh, wrote a uh, farewell letter to Cowboys fans, which is really, really cool. Uh, we'll talk about his impact a little bit later on. But this little factor, just ponder this, Cowboys fans, just real quick. Because Catboy is what they call Stephen Jones. They call him Catboy. Nick Casario is getting the nickname Cook Serio for very different reasons. One's complimentary. I mean, one's demeaning. <laughs> All right, the Catboy one. The Cowboys have, and I got this from um, Over the Cap, so they do a great job and spot track and they keep up with the NFL salary cap and they keep up with deals and contracts. The Cowboys right now have, or at least last I checked, they have the least amount of salary cap space in the league and the second lowest payroll currently in the league. Surprising. What the hell? Second lowest payroll. So, you know, they that which is smart because they, they haven't paid their guys yet, but still hadn't paid Micah, still yeah. hadn't paid CD. So that, that'll increase once they pay those guys those big big money deals. Uh Duran Bland's gonna get paid. Yeah. Second lowest payroll, because they operate through the draft, they acquire through the draft, and it's the cheapest way to acquire talent with the least amount of salary cap space. I I'll admit that is a I mean, hell of a I, I do get it because every single year we hear restructure and restructures have end dates on them. Like, if you look at Dak Prescott's contract, he's making, if you don't re-sign him, you're paying him for, I think, another two to three years. Like, 14, yeah. like, around $20 million a year for the next, the next three years because you you restructured his deal and you basically pushed all that money off so you could re-sign somebody else or you could make that next move. I think that's part of the reason when we talk about them not keeping players is they basically didn't want to keep pushing money back. And there's a chance that they're saying, we're just going to try and get out of this and hopefully stay salvageable and decent while we get out of this, but we realize we're not going to be able to compete for a Super Bowl until we get rid of everybody and restart and get rid of all this dead cap space of all the bad decisions and all the time. It's why when we talk about the, the Texans having to attack quickly because that window, this is the reason. Because when you try and extend a window, you get to the point where you have to keep cutting salary costs and yeah. keep ending up with dead cap. Oh, yeah. 
no, you're right about that. I mean, look at the Buffalo Bills. Yeah. Extending the window, right? And it, it was like, man, why did you cut all the all pros? Well, they extend when you extend the window, you also basically extend your your credit. You gotta yeah. <laughs> in terms of that, that it's gonna come due. That bill will be come come yeah. due at one point. And the, the Ravens went through it. The Ravens have uh, cut a lot of guys because they're trying to extend their window. It's a great point about that. Uh, that's why the, the NFL is kind of built in those five-year windows because that's when you really have the salary cap flexibility and you have the cash to spend. It's like Brewster's Millions. You got the money now, so spend it, Casario. <laughs> spend it because you ain't going to have it after the five-year window is up. You just what you got to pay C.J. Stroud. You ain't going to have that money anymore. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, let's let's uh, get into Rod's rant a little uh, in the next segment. Um, we'll go to break here, get to Rod's rant on the other side. We'll talk about the NFL's quarterback evaluation crisis. It's pretty obvious the NFL doesn't know what the hell they're doing when it comes to quarterback. I'll share a stat with you that is absolutely mind-blowing about quarterback development and could be a little troubling for the NFL. We'll do that on the other side in Rod's round today. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming right back on the horn.
All right, welcome back to the Rodcast. Time to get to Rod's rant of the day. And I want to talk about this uh, quarterback class because most of the projections for the mock drafts have uh, the quarterback, uh, at least the, uh, the quarterback class here as one of the deepest in recent years. And it looks like a lot of the mock drafts are now projecting quarterbacks to go one, two, and three in the NFL draft. J.J. McCarthy's rising up draft rankings. So now it looks like he's going to be a first round pick uh, as well. Um, so that would make four. There are a lot of people that love Bo Nix and think that Bo Nix could end up being a first round pick. So they're projecting somewhere between four to five. And even I don't think Michael Penix will be a first round pick. I like Michael Penix, but, you know, he could he could be thrown in there, too, if a team gets desperate enough and maybe his team wants to move up into the first round because they're afraid he's going to be off the board. I know Seattle makes a lot of sense because they have the former Washington uh, Grub, the former Washington offensive coordinator who is now the offensive coordinator there at Seattle. So that would make a lot of sense, especially in the, in the area. You can already have a bridge quarterback there in Geno Smith, who could be a mentor for him, uh, be running the same system. So familiarity in the same area, essentially because Seattle and then playing in Washington. So you're playing in the same city. So there's a lot of talk that that could happen. And if Seattle is afraid that he's going to get drafted you know, in the first round, late in the first round, and I don't know, they could decide, hey, man, he's going to be our first round pick. Or uh, if they do draft somebody else, then maybe they want to trade back into the first round to get that guy if they're afraid somebody's going to take him. So anyway, my point is, if there's a chance you could get five quarterbacks taken in the first round um, because you got a lot of teams that are obviously quarter, uh, needy uh, for the quarterback position. So the, there have been three times in a common era draft where three quarterbacks have been taken uh, in the top with the top three picks, one, two, and three. It happened in 2021 most recently, Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance. And I think we've been talking recently about that 2021 draft. Trevor, Trevor Lawrence with the Jacksonville Jaguars. Wilson hasn't been traded yet. I don't know what's happening with Zach Wilson or if he will be traded Right now, I guess they may wait till after the draft to trade him. Like, what's the point of trading him now? Yeah. Uh, but Trey Lance, who went third overall, traded for a fourth round pick. Um, and then we know about the Justin Fields recent trade for a sixth round pick. Uh, and Mac Jones was traded for a fifth round pick. So the 2021 class is supposed to be deep. Uh, but now only one of those quarterbacks out of those five that were taken in the first round worked out. Only one of the five. It's talking about a like 20% hit rate there. And out of those top three, that were taken with the top three picks in the NFL draft of 2021. Only Trevor Lawrence has worked out. It happened in 1999. Uh, Tim Couch, Donovan McNabb, and Achilles Smith. Donovan McNabb is probably the only one that we would say worked out um, out of those top three picks, all taken with quarterbacks. And 1971, this one actually was pretty good. Jim Plunkett, Archie Manning, Dan Pastorini. 1971. Yeah. Uh, so, but you know, that one actually is not, that's not bad. Um, but your chances, and this is a shout out to NFL research, because this is where I got this uh, actual stat. If you look at first round quarterbacks in a common era draft since 1967, 130 quarterbacks have been drafted in the first round since 1967. 61 of those 130 have won a playoff game as a starter. That's 46 percent. 58 of the 130 quarterbacks have made a Pro Bowl. That's around 45 percent. So around 45 to around 40 and they round up 47 percent of your quarterbacks who were drafted in the first round either won a playoff game or made a Pro Bowl. Um, and if you go look at the breakdown about where they were drafted in the first round, top five quarterbacks made a Pro Bowl 60 percent of the time. Top 10 quarterbacks made a Pro Bowl. We're talking about first round quarterbacks here historically in the history of the NFL draft since 1967. Uh, 50, 54 percent of top 10 quarterbacks made at least one Pro Bowl, 53 percent of top 15. So basically, that's no difference between your top 10 quarterback yeah. and the top 15 quarterbacks. What they're saying in terms of making a Pro Bowl, um, there is a, a, a significant difference in the top five quarterbacks. If you look at first round quarterbacks overall, I just broke that down to you. That was 45 percent uh, of them made the Pro Bowl playoff uh, wins. If you go look at top five quarterbacks, 54% of them won a playoff game. If you look at top 10 quarterbacks, 50% of them won a playoff game. Look at top 15, 49% of them won a playoff game. 
And if you're looking at just first round quarterbacks overall, as we pointed out, 47% of them won a playoff game. So it, the first round is where you're, where you get your, your quarterback, where your faces of your franchise, where you get your elite quarterbacks, um, your QB ones, but the NFL is still really bad at drafting them. How about this stat? And this is, like I said, mind blowing from 2021 to 2022. There have been 19 quarterbacks selected in the NFL draft, period. Yeah. Right? In the in, the, in its entirety. Only two of the 19 are expected to start week one of the NFL season. Isn't that crazy? Yeah. I mean. Brock Purdy and Trey, and Trevor Lawrence. That's it. Those are the only quarterbacks drafted from 2021 to 2022. The other 19 quarterbacks, they're expected to start week one. It's really tough. To find a quarterback, sometimes you hit. I mean, think about that 2020 draft. It was great. Joe Burrow, Tua, Justin Herbert, uh, uh, Jordan Love now, great, and Jalen Hurts. All the quarterbacks, top taking quarterbacks in that draft were awesome. Um, and then, but you go look at the 2021 quarterback class that we talked about. It's a disaster. Only one of those quarterbacks worked out. Trevor Lawrence, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Justin Fields, Mac Jones. None of those guys worked and, out. And Trevor Lawrence is somebody that people will say hasn't necessarily reached the level that he's supposed to reach yet either. Like he was supposed Very to be true. the guy. And there's still questions in Jacksonville that if he's really going to be the guy to take him to that next level. Yeah. No, that's a great point. Uh, I mean, the 2022 class also – I mean, that was a pretty much a disaster, too, right? Kenny Pickett was the only one in the first round. He was traded. Desmond Ritter traded. Titans quarterback, uh, the Malik Willis. I think he's like third with them. They dropped Matt the quarterback Corral. the next year. That's how bad Malik was, Willis. They they immediately yeah. went and got Will Levis the next year. Exactly. And, you know, Sam Howell is probably the best of that group, and even he's been traded. Bailey, I think Bailey Zappi is still uh, with the Patriots as QB, too. But it just shows you the NFL. The NFL is not getting better. <laughs> at evaluating QBs and projecting QBs and building Q, building these uh, these offensive systems around the skill set of the quarterback, being able to uh, mitigate their weaknesses and being able to highlight their strengths. The NFL is not getting better at this. Is I think is, is, is what's kind of I think troubling is that you would think they would get better at quarterback evaluation. They're not, and I know why they're not. Is it because the NFL is too stubborn and they try to turn this into a science? But when you go look at the last 10 draft cycles, there have been 30 quarterbacks drafted in the first round, according to Albert Breer. Um, 11 of them, and that includes Zach Wilson, are currently still with the team that drafted him. And so it's they're basically broken at 30, a 30% hit rate. And I uh, say 30% uh, rate of quarterbacks you're willing to reinvest in or to double down on. Um, in terms of that investment. So I think that the, the strange thing is that the NFL, they are getting worse, some would argue, at quarterback evaluation. Um, and there's a quarterback evaluation issue in the NFL. And I think it is hurting a lot of quarterbacks. And I think that's why you are seeing some of these um, quarterback resurrections happen because they're they're off in either their evaluation of quarterbacks sometimes, like Baker Mayfield and Geno Smith, or the coaches aren't willing they're not willing to be patient enough. We know the NFL doesn't have patience, yeah. or they are not willing to be flexible enough and creative enough to build the system around the strength of the QB. Yeah, I, I think that's where you look at, you know, in the draft, and this is pretty much in every sport, you judge floor and ceiling on these guys. You say, what's the worst they could be and what's the best they could be? And at some point in the quarterback market, and I think it's because there is no patience, and general managers and coaches know, if I don't have a quarterback, I don't keep my job. It's that simple. So I have to get one and I can't go. I need a quarterback with a high floor because if the ceiling's not high enough, I'm still fired. So I need the highest ceiling I can find. Screw the floor. I don't care if there is no floor, but I need real high ceilings. And so they draft for guys on ceilings, forgetting the fact that, well, that'll tank you real quick. If the floor is 25 interceptions a season. So you have to look at it, and they, they just don't look at the floor for guys. Caleb Williams is a perfect example of a ceiling and floor guy where we can look at Caleb Williams and go, the floor is pretty low for Caleb Williams. We understand he could be mentally. We don't know where he'll be. Uh, you know, we know that he extends plays too often. We don't know if he'll be on track. We know there's systems that he probably wouldn't work well in. There's a lot of floor issues with Caleb Williams where he could be a bust. He also has every trait that you could want in a quarterback that could be great. So his ceiling is through the roof. That's why he's the number one overall pick because no one's looking at the floor. 
they're only looking at how high that ceiling is. And I, I think that's when you look at all these guys, when you look at a Bo Nix right now, you say, let Florida doesn't look that bad. But the ceiling, we kind of know what Bo Nix ceiling is. We don't feel he's going to be that much better, but the floor. So he goes a little bit later when you say, well, we just need a guy, you know, we can use and maybe we'll get something out of him. But they just don't. I don't think that when they're picking quarterbacks because they need them to win, they need them to win now. So you keep your job. It's not about the long term health of the organization. It is about keeping my job. And if it's that way, I need ceiling. Floor doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. No, that's a great point about the ceiling. And for Anthony, uh, Anthony Richardson. Yeah, he's a great example of that. It's just like we don't give a damn what the floor is. The ceiling is what counts. I tell because you know what they're looking for though, Patrick. To your point, they're looking for the guy with the cape. Yes, I need a guy that can put the cape on and be Superman. And if you're looking at a guy with a really, you know, kind of, uh, I guess you're looking at the floor of it, then you're not paying attention to what they said. A guy that is capable of those superhuman moments on a football field. I, I love that. That was a great point there, Patrick. Good stuff. Uh, all right, uh, we'll come back. We'll get into what the facts, what the stats segment on the other side. Uh, got some factoids to share with you from all around the sports world and beyond. This is the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming right back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Uh, I want to say thank you to our good friends over at Callahan General Store, Charlie Wilson, who was the president and uh, CEO and general manager over there. He actually gave us some great uh, yard tips when he came on the, the show. He'll be coming back on the show actually uh, tomorrow. Um, and we'll, uh, I'm sure I'll, I'll, get, I'll pick his brain about golf and some other stuff, but I'll always get a chance to pick his brain about my lawn care and how to make sure I have uh, the most plush, green kind of golf course green grass uh, that, I, that I can get. And he gave me some great tips last time. Told me about putting the pre-emergence down. Said, hey man, spring is springing on us a little bit early this year. So we'll make sure you put the pre-emergence down. That's going to kill all of your, your weeds. Um, to get everything ready to go. They got the barricade product for you, the nitro foss over there at Callahan General Store. That'll keep the weeds away. That'll initially give you a, a really good base uh, to start with. And then you can put the weed and feed. So I'm in the process now. Did the pre-emergence. Going to do the weed and feed. Uh, got it from my friends over at Callahan General Store. You can do the same and put the weed and feed down to grow the good grass and to keep the crab grass and the dandelions out of the yard. I'm trying to have the yard of the month in my neighborhood. All right. Um, I'm in Patrick get a test to it too. I'm working hard on it, trying to get it right. And I know you want to do the same for spring. You want your, you want that golf course grass, that golf course condition of your lawn uh, that you see a lot of your neighbors with. Don't be jealous. Just get over to Callahan General Store. They got the knowledge. They got the supplies. They got the resources for you. And also we know that you may need that beauty to see to cover up some of the, the dried up patches uh, either from the damage from too much sun or the damage from all the winter freezes we had Callahan's has bags of soil amendments special fertilizers to get your lawn back into the beautifully lush and healthy looking yard uh, that you want it to be don't forget also time to begin planting the seedling vegetables for your gardens Callahan's also has a weekly variety of all of that stuff peppers tomatoes melons other plants uh, for you to choose from so get on over to Callahan's general store uh, they also have uh, Easter. Uh, they're going to have Easter surprises. Easter's coming early this year, so be sure to check out their baby chicks. They got ducklings and rabbits uh, that are arriving weekly at Callahan's General Store, so you can pick up your feed out there. That's when you want to bring the kids out there, too. They have a good time hanging out with all the animals, get a chance to see. There's a lot to enjoy at Callahan's General Store, and you also can go there and make sure you get all of the best tips for your lawn care. So go to Callahan's General Store. Still there at 501 Bastrop Highway between downtown and airport. Uh, every day is a Callahan's Day.
All right, I got one for you here. And what the facts, what the stats, uh, Colorado State, Virginia, uh, everybody, uh, at least Longhorn fans are going to be watching this game closely uh, in the first four, the, 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 which will determine who the Longhorns are going to play in the first round of the NCAA tournament. The Colorado State, Virginia total right now is sitting at 118 and a half. Uh, no NCAA tournament game has closed under 120 since 2019. Uh, to your point, Patrick, you've talked about Virginia's uh, slug uh, of a pace and the offense that they, yes. well, the lack thereof, but they have offensively. Offensively, uh, Virginia is the team that's done it twice. <laughs> so no NCAA tournament team has closed under 120 since 2019. It was Virginia twice. Yeah, yeah. that makes sense. They're, Virginia is uh, it's the deal. That's why they have struggles because it, they always say defense wins championships, but the reality is. You have to be really good at both in college basketball because they do want scoring. And so if you only play defense, they're not going to give you free throws on everything if you're not going to be, you know, aggressive in driving the paint. And if you can't hit shots, they're like you're going to get fouls the other way. They're going to score points the other way in college basketball. That's the way they ref the games. It just yeah. is what it is. No, uh, I thought that was interesting because uh, they are, I think they're 362nd or something like that uh, in pace of play, throwing it out there. Okay, another quick one before we get out of here. Uh, Rick Barnes, who Texas, if they win the first round against either Colorado State or Virginia, they'll be playing Tennessee. Uh, Rick Barnes, former coach at Texas, now coaching at U, lowercase t. Rick Barnes, 9-21 and 21 against the spread in NCAA tournament uh, game since 2005. That's the worst coaching record per uh action network where i got this from um also good. also another best teams against the spread this season in the ncaa tournament Iowa state number 24 and 10 uh south carolina 23 and 10 new mexico 23 and 11 yukon 22 and 12 nevada 21 11 worst team against the spread in the ncaa tournament texas 12 and 20 against the spread not good not good. A lot of Longhorn fans are probably like, oh, yeah, I could have told, told you that. Uh, I lost a lot of money on betting on Texas. All right, uh, we come back. We'll uh, get into Texas football. We'll talk Texas spring football. We'll also get into a little bit of the uh, NCAA tournament, um, who the Texas Longhorns will play in the tournament. We'll get into that a little bit. We'll talk Texas spring football storylines and topics on the other side. There are tons of them because Texas starts practice today. Um, so we'll uh, look for any excuse to talk Texas football. On the other side, the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers. Coming back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Some of you sitting in traffic right now are probably a little uh, disappointed in the car you're driving, right? It's probably a little run down. Uh, maybe, you know, it doesn't fit your lifestyle anymore. Maybe it doesn't fit your budget anymore. Uh, maybe you need a bigger car. Whatever the reason that you're in the market for a new car, you're thinking about it, uh, you need to reach out to my friends over at Apple Leasing. They can get you the price you want, the payment you want on the car that you want. They take all the stress and the headaches out of the process for you. We know that navigating the car market it can be really stressful. It can be time consuming. Uh, and that can be, uh, you know, very, very stressful on you, right? Going to different dealerships, uh, vetting the dealers, vetting the, the actual salespeople, going down the rabbit hole to research all the vehicles, to find out how safe they are, or uh, to find out the value of them, uh, the blue book value, all those different things. Those are things you may not have time for. But my friends at Apple Leasing, they can do the hard work for you. You call them, you give them all your specifications, you let them know what uh, type of car you want to 
car or sedan, truck, uh, SUV. You let them know exactly what color you want. Uh, you give them all the details about what kind of budget you're in right now, what kind of budget uh, you have, what the price you're willing to pay, the payment plan that you want to be on. Are you on a lease right now or in a lease right now that will get you out of that lease into a better lease? They're all about getting the best uh, bargain for you, the best value for you. They know that time is money. They know that your time is valuable and they're going to save you both. They're going to save you time, save you money and find you tremendous value. All it takes is one phone call from you and uh, you'll get a quote on any make or model vehicle that you want. They can even give you an estimate on the value of your trade in right over the phone. Apple leasing has what they call a simple interest, easy lease uh, because it makes things well simple and easy. It's going to give you a lot of options, right? So give you flexibility, which is going to give you more possibilities uh, to find the vehicle that fits you best, but more importantly, that fits your budget best. So what are you waiting for? Uh, give my friends at Apple Leasing a call, 512-346-9977. They get all the same discounts and all the same incentives that the dealers do, except my friends at Apple Leasing, they rather pass those savings on to you, the customer. So give them a call today, 512-346-9977, or visit AppleLeasing.com. That's AppleLeasing.com.
Welcome back to the broadcast. Top of the charts Tuesday. That's when my co-host, the idealionaire Patrick Davis, uh, plays jams to reach the top of the Billboard charts on this day in history. I would appreciate all of his uh, creative genius here on the show. As a matter of fact, he also came up with the big fat poll of the day. And you can go uh, discuss that and check that out on the text line, 512-447-3776. Uh, Patrick, let the folks know what the big fat poll of the day is. Who is your favorite underdog in sports history? Your favorite underdog in sports history doesn't necessarily have to be the greatest but your favorite is what we're going for so yeah so we've had a few tony romos on there a good underdog story of tony romo beats eastern illinois and then not drafted and is able to come up and and achieve what he's done uh in the nfl i put jose altuve up there as one of my favorites is uh undersized came from came from basically nothing in venezuela and worked his way up to be an mvp uh in mlb good uh, you know, you could be an NBA. I think Muggsy Bogues is one of the all-time underdogs, being 5'3", and being able to have the career he had in the in MLB. That's, you know, or in NBA. That's a difficult place to to go for someone who is 5'9", 5'10". That's a difficult yeah. world, but 5'3". I agree about that. Yeah. I agree with this. Um, does it count? Because I know you, you got some stipulations about in terms of <laughs> football, so I don't want to – that, that t- don't mention Tom Brady because he can't be in the conversation. Uh, but you want ultimate underdogs, guys who you know undrafted yeah. had to do it the hard way. Does Warren Moon count? I that's I was thinking about him earlier because he's very much on the cusp of a guy that was you know not given the ability, and he falls in that weird area that he was because he was a black mobile quarterback that wasn't even that yep. mobile really. He was I mean, but, he wasn't even that mobile, <laughs> but, but he was considered to be. Uh, yeah. and that was not the prototype. So no one in the NFL wanted to touch him, uh, and then came in and had the career. I think he's on that borderline. I wouldn't necessarily, I think you can consider him one, uh, but I, I, I wouldn't put him as my favorite just because it is, he's a little, and maybe that's, you know, because it's, it's looking back on it and it's in its entirety of his career that I'm not looking at it in the time of this guy's, there's no way he'll be able to achieve. I mean, really, yeah. you could just name any Oilers an underdog, I think too. Just in general. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just because it, it's all about, yeah, it's all about the story, the storyline of that yeah. player. Like you talk about Kurt Warner, guy was sacking groceries, played in the Arena Football League, and then the path, and it, it obviously it's the path of an underdog, um, um, the road less traveled. So I'm just trying to think of guys who came to greatness, high achievement via that kind of path. And uh, Warren Moon is definitely one of those guys, but you're right. I don't know if people would consider him a traditional underdog, but it's a good question. Uh, so big fat poll of the day. Uh, go check that out. Uh, discussing that on the uh, text line, 512-447-3776. You also hit up my man Patrick via Twitter. He's at It's Patrick Davis in the Twitterverse. I'm at Rod Davis. We're going to talk a ton of spring football, of course. Uh, we'll go behind the burn on curtain next, se- next segment and talk uh, more spring football. We'll get specific. I'll get into – I got to take about uh, Jade Barron. I got to take about Quinn Ewers. We'll see if we can get to both of them when we go behind the burnt orange curtain. We got your horn headlines. My man Patrick will get you informed uh, and get you educated on all the top headlines of the day. Uh, we'll get into that. And also, of course, we're in the midst of the March Madness. Uh, the Longhorn men and women, or at least the women, know who they're going to play. The Longhorns will play either Colorado State or Virginia. That will be settled tonight, today. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about that as well before we get into any of the those uh, discussions. Let's hit my man Patrick up for the Horn Headlines. All right, your Horn Headlines brought to you by Top Gun Rentals and Lawn Equipment. Texas Baseball starts a two-game miniseries tonight against the Air Force Academy Falcons. This will be the third year in a row the teams will play in an early series matchup with Texas being up 2-1 in those meetings. Texas will send Grant Fontenot to the mound, who threw for three innings, only allowing one hit in his last outing. In the MLB, the reigning National League Cy Young winner Blake Snell signed a deal yesterday with the San Francisco Giants. The two-year deal is reportedly for $62 million and ends an extended free agency for the ace. The Houston Astros have been in conversations with Snell's. However, they could not come close enough to Snell's demands and will continue to search for more starting pitching. And the NCAA tournament begins tonight with two of the first four matchups trying to make it to the field of 64. Two 16 seeds, Wagner and Howard kick off the action at 540 with the winner moving on to face North Carolina. And then at roughly 810, Colorado State will take on Virginia in a matchup to take the 10 seed against Texas on Thursday. And that is your Horn Headlines.
All right, thank you, uh, Patrick, for the horn headlines. We appreciate that. Texas Spring Football starting up today. Sark uh, tweeted this out um, from his Twitter account just now. Uh, I'll read it. Uh, The obsessed inspire others to be obsessed. You can feel when someone loves what they do when they live inside their craft and it pushes everyone around them to care about something that much. Just obsess. um, And these are different pictures of images, essentially. Um, It's called a calling for a reason. When you find your obsession, you won't be able to ignore it. Destiny doesn't whisper. It screams. There you go. So Sark, um, once again, doubling down on, I think the, I guess it is the, the motto of the, the season for Texas. It's going to be the theme of the season, obsession, all right? uh, being obsessed with it. And he certainly, he said, I'm obsessed with winning a national title. I'm obsessed with it. So if that is the case, then, you know, this is where it starts for Texas. And uh, I like that, you know, Sark, he, he's throwing it out there. I mean, he's not, he has never, uh, at least at Texas, um, he has never shied away from the expectations. Once again, talking about how he's obsessed. And I, re- I remember obsession. I mean, I, I do remember being obsessed with the game of football. I still am obsessed with the game of football. But it is obsession. Like, it is the ultimate uh, love of something. And obsession means you're going to sacrifice, uh, dedicate yourself, sacrifice anything, dedicate yourself and commit to it um, and prioritize it over you know, a lot of things. And that's why it can be an unhealthy obsession. I'll talk about the competitive sickness. I remember Kobe, Kobe Bryant saying, listen, I don't have enough time in the day to be a good friend. I, I'm a good teammate. Say, if you want to go out to the club and you want to go out to dinner, and I can't do that because I got I got other stuff to do. He said, but if you want to go work out with me and you want to, you know, when you want to come shoot around with me, you want to go to the weight room with me, I'll do that with you all day because that's what I'm doing most of the time, dedicating myself to my obsession, which is to be the best basketball player of all time. And then I got a family. I got a wife. Yeah. I got kids. All right. And you say, I got to dedicate time to them because I'm trying to be the best husband I can be trying to be the best father. I, can be. I think we're all trying to be the best husband, father, mom, daughter, whatever. And also trying to be the best student you can be and be the best employee you can be. And most of us are probably failing miserably. But <laughs> you know, the whole point is he's talking about, you know, the things that you're obsessed with in your life. Right. You every, you should be obsessed with your family and your and you should be obsessed with your significant other and your kids. Um, but, you know, when you find something like that, you do consider a calling. And I remember this because I considered football my calling uh, and asked Tom Brady about obsession. I asked him about his first love, which was football. And he told Giselle at one point, like, hey, you know, I'm, I'm choosing football right now. And I know you want me to choose you, but I'm choosing football. Yeah, that's my first love. And we see how that publicly played out. Sometimes <laughs> a woman's like, well, I'm not going to be your number one priority. I'm out. And he's like, see you. Yeah. And I'm choosing yeah, I'm yeah. choosing my I'm, my I'm my choosing, my, cross, choosing my, my obsession. structure. Yeah, I'm choosing my love, which is football. The reason I'm here. You wouldn't even be with me if I didn't play football. I wasn't good at it. You 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 walk right past me on the street. We know who the hell I was. I'm Tom Brady, the GOAT. And she's like, well, I helped you to come to GOAT. My support. That love. So it, the obsession thing, I totally get it. But um, it's interesting because I've had that conversation with people before. And now Sark, he's, you know, ready to, uh, you know, kind of express that obsession. And he's talked about it openly now multiple times. Um, so I, I'm excited for him because, uh, like he said, he's a calling for him. He's in a perfect place to accomplish his dream which of winning a national title. It is, it is a reality for Texas. Is the reality, is it, is it a reality this season is, is the real question. Uh, hell, it could have been last year. You were a couple of plays away from playing for a national title. Your red zone offense would have been a little bit better. And that's probably what is feeding his obsession is yeah. how close he got. He was right there. Patrick, he was, and they didn't even have a great game, by the way. Texas played oh, a yeah. bad game. Texas was outplayed and outcoached by Washington. And yet you had, a chance on the last series of the game to go out there and have a game winning drive to, to take you to the national championship. And he was just that close. And he's probably thinking now, all right, if I was just that close now, what can I do 
to put me over the top? What can I do now to ultimately help me achieve my goal, which is winning a national title? And by the way, the college football gods that helped them out, Patrick, Nick Saban retired for you. Jim Harbaugh's gone to the NFL. The college football guys are helping you right now a little bit, too. It seems like the landscape, right, a lot of factors and variables seem to be helping Texas at least be in a prime position to win a national title. Yeah, I mean, you, you also have the extended playoffs, so you have a little bit more buffer to get yourself yep. in there. You have a little margin for error. The yep. margin for error. There's a lot for you to be able to get to where you need to be. You have the experience. You get Quinn Ewers to come back for another year. Uh, and I think that's when you talk about the obsession and what he wants to see. I, I mean, I know being driven at certain things and, and really when you work really hard at things, what you really want is people to fight with you. And sometimes it's hard because if you're the person who's going to work, you know, extended hours and for, for Sark, is he's, he's somebody who's going to be sitting and he's going to be the first one there and the first one to leave. What he's trying to get out of these players is, and the coaching staff and everybody else is when you see me there, your question shouldn't be what time did he get there? It should be what time do I need to get there? What time should I be there with you? And, and those are the things you love when you talk, you know, me and you talk sports. The reason we love doing this is because we're, we love talking sports. We do it every single day. And if we weren't doing this on the radio, we'd still be talking to our friends and talking to people about this stuff because we we are we are that way. I'm going to talk NBA with people all day, all the time, just because that's who I am. And that's what I do. Uh, and I think for Sark, this, this is what he is. He's obsessed with college football. He's obsessed with coaching the game. And now that you you nailed it, it, it you he tasted it. It was there. In his head, he was already celebrating. He was planning. He already had that. Okay, we're, we're, we're so close. I can already see what shoes I'm wearing at the parade. <laughs> I'm already there. But you have, yep. to, you have to take all that away and take the step back. And, you know, you get that much closer. It makes you want it that much more. And he's just trying to get the rest of his team to understand. I know how hard, it, you know, it's been to get there. We have a lot of new guys on this team. A lot of people are going to have to step up. And can you guys take the leap you need to take because you can't rest on your laurels and say, well, we almost did it last year. We'll do it again this year because a lot of those guys are gone. Yeah, and that was obviously that's a that was a highly, high, you know, a highly talented team because you had 11 guys that were invited to the combine. You're going to have two to three first round picks. You're going to have four, maybe five guys drafted in the first two rounds of that draft. That's a really talented football team. And you got a lot of talent uh, coming back, or at least you brought in some proven commodities via the transfer portal. But you got a lot of talent, of course, that you've been stockpiling over the years um, in the recruiting classes. They're just unproven commodities. And this is the year, right? This is the fourth year for Sark. So that roster is totally overall. It, these are all his guys. And yeah. what he said last season was he liked the way that team um, was built and constructed because it it he said it talked like a Sark team. He said they they played like a Sark team. They carried themselves like a Sark team, and he started to feel like that th these were his guys and they had his mentality, his philosophy. It, that's going to be reflected in this obsession because these are all Sark guys. And Sark talks about recruiting certain types of players, right? Bringing in certain types of players because he's big on the culture and the best way to really regulate the culture and protect the culture is watch who you bring into it. And he's talked about bringing in guys with really good football character from great football programs. A lot of time that make it easy because great football programs like a Duncanville and like a Westlake, they weed out bad football character or they rehabilitate it. So you come in there with a, a bad attitude and you're lazy and you're, un you're a selfish teammate. You ain't going to last at a Westlake anyway. Um, but if you are willing to make the commitment, then it'll trend that the culture will transform you. And then by the time you are, uh, you know, developed into being a, a prospect to play at the college level, you'll have better football character. Right. And I think that's why he likes going to those programs. He's talked about recruiting competitors. This was on display with uh, my man X man when he broke the record at the combine. He didn't have to ran the four two five. I think it was pretty obvious he was fine and he wanted to go back. He's like, no, I can, I can, I can, I can break the record. I want yeah. to go back because I want to compete. And Sark talks about, I want guys that just like to compete. I, I, I recruit guys who compete in different sports who are competitive uh, outside of uh, football and outside the football field. They were competitive in the classroom. I want guys that compete in everything they do, which is that's part of the competitive sickness. We talk about that with guys like Michael Jordan. Now that's an extreme example of it, <laughs> but uh, MJ and the way he likes to gamble, but everything about MJ was, I want to compete. Let's compete so I can win. 
and he can compete in every aspect of his life. Now, you can say that's unhealthy, which I'm sure it is. Uh, but this Sark is about bringing in a certain type of mindset, a certain type of athlete. And he wants uber competitors and he wants guys with really good football character that those are probably the two tent poles to his culture, two of the, the biggest tent poles to his culture. And speaking of culture, we had this discussion early in the show, and I think it was an interesting one. You brought up the fact they're going to have a lot of uh, new faces. They will yeah. CJ Vogel over at On Texas Football claims 17 of the uh, members of the recruiting class are going to come in and be in this spring as early enrollees, and they're going to have seven transfer portal additions uh, that are all going to be in via uh obviously transfer portal acquisition but they're all going to be in this spring too um so th that's you don't look at it guys that's 24 with 24 new faces on a team that's a lot of new faces and i think for sark the uh the advantage is now that the culture is implemented and you have been really careful and very meticulous about you know keeping the culture intact and who you bring into the culture and all those things. And you've been really mindful of it. I think now the, the players that you brought in who are smart guys, you know, they're going to, they're, they're now going to teach the culture. They're now show the guys, you know, the, the, the expectations uh, the different methods, the habits, the practices, you know, what's expected of them, uh, the level of intensity, the level of work ethic that that's expected. So it doesn't have to do that and be as hands on doing that anymore. And the belief is now that those guys will be passing down those lessons to the next recruiting class and to the younger guys coming in or the new additions. But here's something to consider because we talked about this with the culture and Sark is big about the culture. He's big about leadership, but you're losing a lot of leadership. You're losing, you know, X-Man, you're losing, you know, JT Sanders, who was a, a leader, you're losing Christian Jones. Jay Witt was a great leader and Jay Witt is who I kind of want to get to because there are certain guys who did embody the culture for Texas. They, they, they were walking testimonies of that culture. Right. Rojo was it for the first two years. He's the guy that called uh, the team meetings. He was a former quarterback, so had a natural leadership position. But he's the one that called the team meeting out through Texas Tech. And he's the one that transformed that running back room into being kind of what it is today. And 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 players talk about his leadership and, and, and the young guys talk about his leadership. This is not a starter. But he, you know, he was a guy that still everybody respected in that locker room. They watched his journey. They watched him unselfishly switch positions. They watched his work ethic. They watched his dedication, his commitment. And then he became a culture bearer. They embodied the culture. He was a, a living, breathing example of it for, for players. And every time he walked through the weight room, the training room, the practice fields, and getting there early, staying late, putting in extra reps, it challenged everybody on that team to uh, really question their own their own work ethic, right? It held everybody accountable because you have to ask me, if this guy is staying late, if this guy's dedicated, am I that dedicated? Am I that unselfish? Am, am, I, am I staying late? Am I doing what's necessary so I can be the best player for this team? You ask yourself all those questions, and that's necessary to have those guys on your roster like that. Jay Witt was that. When Rojo left, he became the body of they watched his journey through the injuries and him rededicate himself to the game and watched how unselfish he was. A great quote from Brendan Marion says, you know, uh, uh, what you do without the football, that shows how much you love your teammate. Right. And Jay Witt loves his teammates. That's why they always say offensive linemen love their teammates because they never get the ball. They don't give a damn about the ball. They just, they just want they just want to fight for their teammates every damn play. I know the center gets it, but that's about it. everybody else. They just want to fight for their teammates. And usually defenders, unselfish, uh, unless the ones in the back end because we want the football. Uh, but you get my point. And Jay Witt was that. He embodied that. He was the living example of that. So you had Rojo, Jay Witt, not starters. But guys who still were so respected by their teammates because of their dedication, because of their commitment, that they became the culture bearers. Who is that guy on this team? Yeah, and, and I'll throw in another point of this. It's somebody who works for everything and doesn't feel that they're owed anything. Amen. It's that Amen. attitude. It's that yeah. attitude of walking in when somebody else is complaining because they feel that they're getting shortchanged or anything else. And you smile and you go in and you do the work and you do that and find the way. And when someone wants to complain, they look at you and they say, I can't complain if he's not complaining. Yep. And that for a guy like Jay Witt and for Rojo, who when they're saying, I want playing time, and you go, You're going to take it from Rojo? You think you can take that playing time from him? Do you think you can take that playing time from Jay Witt? Because he's not complaining when he's not getting passes. You think you need more targets than, than Jay Witt needs? Yeah. You didn't complain he about that? Block. 
He's a and, blocker, right? Yeah. Great blocker. And, and so th- <laughs> that attitude right there, that mentality of being able to go in is so important. And that's what you're trying to find when you're trying to find those leaders in the locker room that are not the top guy is somebody who doesn't need to be the star, doesn't need to be that, and will still walk in with the attitude of, I'm a big part of this. I understand the bigger picture, and I'm just as much of a champion when we win as anyone else on that field because I know what I'm doing as part of it. And if I my, my attitude and my positivity and my, my work ethic can push it that way, I can mean it. And that's when we're talking about who you see on this team. You mentioned earlier Michael Taft is a perfect example yeah. of a guy who just kept working as a walk-on and then built his way up into now being a part of rotation. But instead of hearing him, you know, want to keep progressing, and you know, he's he's working to progress. He's working to get better. He's working to get on the field more. But you, he's helping anybody else. He's helping the younger guys that could be taking his spot. Guys like that. Mm-hmm. A guy like David Benda, who we know is competing but has continued to persevere, could leave the school, could have transferred multiple times by now, could have left and, and gone somewhere where he's definitely talented enough to be playing and be a surefire starter anywhere, but for him to be back at Texas and then wanting to compete for that position. Uh, I, I, I'll give you Savion Red is a guy who we need to see how he progresses this year, but has come in as a wide receiver, fought in that room, wasn't you know didn't necessarily find that place. They moved him over, started using him in the Red Cat. Last season, now he's put on a large amount of weight in off season because they're doing that and the bought into what the coaches said. Guys like that, and you don't know, we don't know, we're not in the locker room. We don't know if they have that intangible quality of a positive attitude, the intangible quality uh, of being able to be steadfast in the in the face of adversity. Can they do those? But if those guys can, then they can become those types of leaders. Yeah, no, it's interesting because uh, it's, it's a different dynamic. I mean, ideally, you want your quarterback to be the best leader on your team. And I think Quinn will step up this year and show more of that vocal leadership and be that leader. This is Quinn's team this year. Um, but it's interesting, the dynamic that has developed with Sark's team is that it hasn't even been starters necessarily who have been the most respected leaders on the team. And as I call them, the culture bearers, it has been uh, guys who have basically led by example in the, in the team um, they galvanize around them because they see their sacrifice and commitment. So I don't know who it's going to be this year. I love your Benda thing. Cause Benda is competing for a spot. It's only two real spots that are like just open spots where we don't, don't actually know who's going to play their uh, linebacker spot o- opposite Anthony Hill and the left guard spot on the offensive line. Um, but every other every other position is has a front line starter pretty much. We're just in spring watching who's going to penetrate um, and who's going to steal targets, who's going to penetrate the rotation of guys and who's going to yeah. – Steal targets, target share with the wide receivers. You know, snap distribution with the with the running backs. Uh, what's your rotation of the uh, the offensive line? Right, who are your best five guys? Who's on the rotation of the interior defense line? Even though Collins and Broughton are going to be your top two guys. Um, yeah, I, mean, I think I guess kickoff return and punt return or maybe maybe something. Um, there's a competition for, but not many open spots. Place players are competing for. It's more about competing for playing time and getting into the rotation and getting to uh, the, the this target share and distribution share of different positions. All right. So there you go. Some spring football conversation on the other side. We'll get to uh, Rod's rant of the day. We'll continue talking spring football. I think the coaches have finally listened to me or maybe Black Stradam has just predicted it or maybe great minds think alike. I'm not sure. And I don't care because I think the, uh, the Longhorns, if this report is uh, accurate, I think they're uh, they're they're moving in the right direction when it comes to this player. And also uh, Quinn Ewers There's something that Quinn Ewers needs to work on now. If he's going to be the first quarterback taken in the NFL draft next year, if he's going to be a guy that NFL scouts look at to be potentially the number one overall pick QB one, 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 one in the NFL draft, something that he he and his people need to look at that he may need to work on. We'll talk about that on the other side as well. All of that and more right here on the Rodcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming right back on the horn.
All right, welcome back to the broadcast. Time to go behind the burnt orange curtain. Feel like we've been behind the burnt orange curtain all morning long. That's because Texas spring football is starting on the 40 acres, and we look for any excuse to talk Texas football, uh, and especially when there are actual pads being put on. So uh, we'll uh, talk some more updates because I'm sure there'll be some updates coming out uh, from spring football. My friends over at On Texas Football, go check them out. Uh, CJ Vogel. Uh, Jerry Hamilton, my man Bobby Burton, I believe they're uh, talking to him. Uh, spring football, we'll get some of those nuggets here from just a second uh, from those guys. But I want to talk about Quinn Ewers here in just a second because um, Quinn Ewers, this is a big year for him, no question about it. There is talk that he could be the top quarterback taken off the board if things go right for him, that he could be a Heisman finalist. Um, but he's got to work on a couple of things. Uh, I don't necessarily think it's uh, it, it, we expect him to take the same leap or a similar leap that he took from year one at Texas to year two and from year two to year three. And if he can take that leap, then I do think it's possible Quinn Ewers could be the first quarterback taken and he could be, you know, a Heisman finalist. Uh, but one of the things I want, I want to see him work on in the spring is uh, sack avoidance. It's become a popular term. It's an old term. But now it's becoming more and more popular because analytics, right, deep dive analytics have shown it to be a stat that when you're looking at uh, pressure to sack rate, right, how often a pressure um, for a quarterback turns into a sack. And also analytics has pretty much mm, it's it's pretty much revealed that 50 percent of sacks, like half the sacks are attributed to quarterbacks. And then all it's not all on the offensive line, the offensive line. You know, there are certain um, blocking schemes, right? There are certain ways to block things. And the quarterback's responsible sometimes for, first, uh, for certain defenders uh, in pressure packages. Uh, the quarterback's movement in the pocket or lack thereof in the pocket. Uh, sometimes them abandoning the pocket. That can all lead to sacks. And that's not on the O-line sometimes. That's on the QB. Holding on to the ball too damn long. That can also be on the quarterback. So basically what they have figured out from analytics is that half the sacks are on the QB. All right, just throw it out there. Close to half. Not, not every quarterback is like that, but on average, that's that's kind of the number. And with that being said, they're looking now for more quarterbacks who have sack avoidance. It's not a stat yet, but I guarantee you in about two years, sack avoidance will be a stat. And Patrick Mahomes yeah. is going to lead the NFL in because <laughs> Patrick Mahomes avoids most sacks than any human being on the planet. He's brilliant at it, avoiding sacks. And, and you would think, oh, man, uh, if you are really gifted athletically, then you are, uh, then you obviously can avoid sacks really well. Not the case. We talked about Justin Fields yesterday. Yes. Justin Fields has the highest sack rate in the history of the NFL. All right. And the highest interception rate and sack rate in the last three years in the NFL, but the highest sack rate in the history of the NFL, pretty much. <laughs> and yet he is one of the most mobile and most gifted uh, quarterbacks athletically the league has ever seen. He's actually led his team in rushing and passing, one of 14 quarterbacks to do so two years. That's really tough to do, but I digress. Doesn't necessarily mean you know how to maneuver in the pocket as a pocket passing quarterback. Because what NFL scouts want to see you do is keep your eyes downfield so that you can watch the progression of the routes. All right, and avoid the pressure by feeling the pressure. We got a great uh, cut. We're gonna play from JJ Watt later on in what the who said that. And I guess I'm, a, you know, I'm spoiling who said that, um, but he's talking about uh, tr trying to hit Tony Romo. And that was a game winning touchdown that Tony Romo threw. And he thought he see, he literally said, he said, I was trying to break his back. I had, a, yeah. I had an easy shot at him. I had a, I, it was just me and Tony Romo and he couldn't see me. His back was turned to me. He said, I was trying to break his damn back. And Tony Romo didn't see him because he couldn't, his back was turned to him. He felt him. Yeah. Now, sometimes that's out of your periphery. You can, you can see a guy like, sees, oh, that's kind of weird. And then you'll react. Your athletic instincts will take over. But Tony Romo had his back to him and then spent to this, had a spin move to, to get away to avoid the sack and then threw a, a game winning touchdown pass. And Tony Romo actually had great sack avoidance too. He was really great at avoiding sacks. Hell, we, Longhorn fans, you remember in the Sugar Bowl? Remember Michael Penix? Remember how many guys had a, had a, had a, had a shot on him? I want to say Byron Murphy had a, had a kill shot on him at one time. Oh, one of our edge defenders had a kill shot on him too and missed him. Yeah, Who I, was I it? can't remember. Was it Ethan Burke? Was it Burke? I think it, it might have been Burke. I think it might have been Burke. I'm talking about guy with nobody but Penix and them. And then Penix just with a slight little move, just a subtle move in the pocket, uh, uh, buys himself a little bit. It's almost like an NBA player 
like a very savvy NBA player creating space so he can get a shot off. You know what I mean? That's what a, basically is what a quarterback's doing about. You ain't got a lot of room. Yeah. Just like in the NBA, you ain't got a lot of room to create that shot, to create that space, but it's so movements, right? It's an elbow here. It's a hip here. It's a, you know what I mean? Boom, boom. It's so little movements. And then you bought yourself enough time and enough space to make that throw or to make the pass or to get the shot off. And I don't, not every quarterback has it. I think it is something that is innate. I don't know if you can teach it. I, and I don't, I, I don't know how well you can cultivate it. You can get better at anything, but I think it's natural. Justin Fields college to sack pressure rate was 23.6% in the NFL. 20, it, uh, it was at 23.2%. His college sack to pressure rate. Like I said, his sack rate is the highest. It has sack rate in history of the NFL. Mahomes in college, sack to pressure rate, 11.4% in college, 11.3% in the NFL. Caleb Williams actually is a little bit of an outlier. He has an 18.6% uh, pressure to sack rate in the last two years, but that number drops to 16% on first and second down on early downs. It's up to 25% on third downs. Like 24.7%. That's a real big number. So yeah. that is a little bit concerning. But I would say also Joe Burrow was an outlier. And well, we have this Joe Burrow audio because Joe Burrow talks like a 30 second. Joe Burrow yeah. actually talks about this. And Joe Burrow basically says sacks are overrated. Essentially, the way that he defines and they're overrated. Um, we have this idea here. This is Joe Burrow talking about sacks. Here it is and why he thinks they're overrated. You were sacked, what, seven times in the Super Bowl? Something like that. Well, here's the thing about sex. So there's good sex and bad sex, right? Sure. You know, you look at the stats. Yeah, I got sacked a lot. But you look at when they happen. Third down sex. Who cares about third down sex? I'm going to try to extend the play as long as I can on third down to get the first down. Unless I'm in field goal range and it's going to back me up, then I'll throw away, throw the ball away and get some points. But I think sacks are an overblown stat. So he's saying on third. So maybe Caleb Williams has the Joe Burrow philosophy on third down. Like, hey man, third down. I'm gonna try. I'm trying to make a play. I don't give a damn about no sacks and care about anything. I'm trying to make a play because it's it's obviously last down before we're gonna uh, punt the football away. So that could be the case too. But that's something to keep up with. And here's, here's my here's my challenge for Quinn Ewers, who right now sack to pressure rate according to sports uh, sports uh, uh, sports information solutions SIS. They claim his sack to pressure rate is 33%. 33%. Now, J.J. McCarthy's pretty high, too. He's at 22%. You know what Michael Penix is at? 9.4% sack to pressure rate. That guy's sack avoidance ability is through the roof. Now, they should start putting it on Madden, too. Up there with all the other things, yeah. right? They, the, they got, you know, uh, speed. They got agility. Um, they got hands. They got arm strength. Sack avoidance should be one of those skills because some players are really, really good at it. And it's not necessarily an athletic thing. Like I said, Justin Fields is terrible at it. And on third down, Caleb Williams is bad at it. So and Joe Burrow talked about – Joe Burrow was the most sacked quarterback to even get to a Super Bowl. No quarterback had been sacked more times than Joe Burrow and made it to a Super Bowl. So there was some uh, there was some uh, depth to his argument. There's no doubt about it. But that is something that, that that scouts are paying more attention to: sack avoidance. And Quinn Ewers is terrible at it. He engage. He's basically sack engagement. He's he self sacks a lot because he looks at the pressure. He's staring right at it instead of avoiding the pressure by feeling the pressure and then keeping your eyes downfield so that you can make the right throw and get deeper into your progressions. How are you going to get deep into your progressions if you're taking your eyes from the downfield vertical routes yeah. to the guy that's rushing you right in front of your face? You can't. you got to feel that pressure and make and maneuver in the pocket and make and create space. He's not doing that well enough. That's something I need to see him improve on. Sack avoidance instead of sack engagement by Quinn Ewers in 2024. Yeah, and it's yeah, and it's one hundred percent right. It's not just avoiding the sack and throwing the ball away every time. It's how do you extend plays? How do you get the ball out? How do you make the play where everybody freaks out because you got the ball out right before the guy came in and got you? How do you and I, and so much like there is such a un, understated thing of just moving back and forth a little bit, just moving a little bit around in the pocket so people can't get a clean shot at you because. Yeah. They're running full speed, and you feel it enough, and you just take one step forward, and they're still going to get an arm around you, but they're not hitting you. They're now an arm around you, and now you can spin, you can get around, and you can 
But if you just stand completely still in the pocket, they can tee off and they're coming right at you. And then all of a sudden you're trying to run out of a dead stop and pick up acceleration to move out of the way of a moving train as opposed to always kind of moving a little bit. And they can't build up. They have to keep moving. They have to change their direction. Just little things like that that Patrick Mahomes is really, really good at of kind of just moving around a little bit in the pocket so people are tr constantly trying to find you and figure out the way best way to get to you. That's exactly right. You you don't want to be a fixed target. Yeah. Um, and even though the, the, the old quarterbacks, the Tom Brady's of the world, your you know, your Peyton Manning's, your, your statues like Dan Marino, they were amazing at it. And they didn't, they couldn't even move really well, but they were great at just maneuvering in the pocket just enough to buy themselves enough space to be able to make an accurate throw or to buy themselves time, like you said, extend the play so they can get deeper into the progressions. That's what I want to see a little bit from Quinn. He doesn't have to be elite at it, but it's something that I've noticed that I you can you can make the argument that he's poor at it. Yeah. That is one of the worst parts of his skill set, kind of like his deep ball, that sack avoidance. Can I can you avoid sacks, avoid those negative plays? Because not all quarterbacks are great at it. So something that he needs to work on. Um, and I think I want to see more of that uh from Quinn in the spring. All right, I wanted to get to my Jade Barron take, so I'm gonna save it. I'll get to it at the top of the nine o'clock in addition to our NFL take. So we'll get to, I got, I got some Cowboys uh, discussion we want to get to. We got some Texans uh, discussion that we'll get into because Nick Casario went on 610 um, and talked to those guys about his his philosophy on free agency, uh, about the D, the D lineman that they signed, about the trade with the Vikings. So we'll, we'll play that audio too. And we'll go into Raj Ram today, which is about the NFL's uh, miscalculation of quarterback evaluation. We'll talk about that too. Uh, so we'll, we'll say the Jaday Barron rant. Like I said, it'll come up in the top of the nine o'clock. We'll get back to that and we'll hit our NFL discussion there too. So let's uh, take the break here and then we'll come back and get into a little off the record. Uh, some of the stories, the wacky wild stories in the sports world and beyond. Uh, we'll come right back. This is the broadcast uh, featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers coming right back on the horn.
All right, welcome back to the Rodcast featuring my man Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime on Rod Davis. Time for Off the Record. We'll be quick here because I know we're up against it. All right, first of all, Patrick, did you see the soul-snatching posterization of a John Collins by Anthony Edwards last night? Did I you did. see this dunk? I did. That was – that's. Lord. I feel bad for the guy. That is <laughs> – that was – it was, man. I think you're right. Everybody had sympathy for John Collins. Like, oh, man. Like, because I really, I like, I, it's one of those <laughs> things where you say, I respect that you went up and tried to stop it. Oh, I respect, man. I respect the hustle and that you said no easy baskets, but mm. it Just did not away, end man. well. It, yeah, Just that's <laughs> one, that's one, those two points were not worth it. No, because you, now you are, you're a meme, you're a gift for the forever, like forever now, yeah. John Collins. And he did get a head contusion as a result of, you have now, just, just type in Anthony Edwards in your search machine and the dunk will come up. You haven't seen the yes. dunk. Don't do it while you're driving. It is crazy. It's one of the greatest posterizations that you've ever seen. We were talking about sack avoidance earlier on. Well, let's just say John Collins got sacked almost. It was close. It was, <laughs> it was close, man. It's, uh, Anthony Edwards got really high. I think at one point, I believe the ball is probably close to the top of the 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 like not the backboard but the obviously the the box in the square. Yeah, yeah. It's close. It's close there. Yeah, it no, really it, it was up there. And then yeah, he doesn't actually make it all the way to the rim. He kind of throws it in from he about kind of throw it in. like yeah. six seven inches away from the rim, which he would have made it to the rim if there was not a guy he ran into two feet from the rim. <laughs> like he it was, fully uh, no, ran into a guy. And so that it was, yeah, it, it was it, superhuman. But this is the thing, Anthony Edwards. Then go in the slam dunk contest. If you can do that, slam dunk yeah. contest. And then John Collins is gonna, you know, get him to come out of the crowd and try and block it again and do it again, and you'll win the slam dunk contest. Wow. <laughs> yeah, no, if, if that was a dunk, it would have won the dunk contest with that one. It was, it was wild. Uh, speaking of NBA, uh, so we might as well just stay with the NBA. So we're talking off the record NBA stuff. Did you see that the Orlando Magic had to uh, delete a photo from its social media page? I did not see this. The Orlando Magic realized they made a mistake after his social media team posted what it felt was an innocent jersey swap between Grady oh. Dick and Anthony Black. Yes, I did. They I did, did a jersey swap, and they knew exactly what they were doing because they got him on camera discussing it beforehand. Uh, the two rookie hoopers met up on the court to show love to each other following the Magic's 111-96 win over the Raptors. And after talking for a bit, uh, they swapped jerseys. And obviously on the back of Grady Dick's jersey uh, is great is Dick. And then on the back of Anthony Black's jersey is Black. And they decided uh, with Anthony Black <laughs> all right, uh, and Grady Dick to do a jersey swap. Uh, just imagine jerseys turned around yes. and Anthony Black is first and Grady Dick is next. And that's why you got the inappropriate jersey swap comment. Yeah, no, it, 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 look, yeah. Grady Dick has a sense of humor. He does. He's kind of the, he was the one who showed up in the draft because he's from Kansas in the uh, the the ruby red slippers outfit, the yes. Dorothy slippers outfit, or the Dorothy yes, shoes. So that's yeah, he's he's had this. It, the video is funnier because the video you can tell they one hundred percent know what they're doing. Oh, they were trolling. They were trolling everybody. Like, dude, this is gonna be viral. No, be it, like, literally, Grady <laughs> Dick goes over to him. You see Anthony Black look at him and he goes. Okay, and then he runs over and gets a photographer, comes back, and then they go to set up, and then Anthony walks around to the other side to make sure it says it the right way. <laughs> no, right. The video, they, yeah, uh, the video is nice hey, of it of, of seeing what it is. They, now they are gonna have to go after if the, if the league's gonna have to go after and be like, hey, hey, Grady, you can't be trading jerseys every because you know you're gonna trade you jerseys with with Trey Young now. <laughs> yeah. You're right. That's a great point. Derek White. <laughs> <laughs> yeah the list is there's a long list it's Jaylen a long Brown. list and it's a long i mean really any long, color is funny with it it's a long season you're right it, it, it really is yeah honestly you can put almost anything you can go Jokic if you want to i mean it's just james it Harden? doesn't matter you, yeah, you can, yeah it doesn't matter what you do as long as you got the the grady dick at the end you're good as long as you're good you're gonna be good there every every name's gonna fit there all right you, it, it, it's gonna be funny because guys just guys being dudes. All right, there you go. All right, uh, good stuff there. Oh, also, I want to bring this up while we got a little time. Um, there's going to – you probably will be into this, Patrick. Uh, apparently, LeBron James and J.J. Reddick are going to team up for a basketball-centric podcast. They are, yes. I believe and, it comes uh, out today. 
I believe today. Are you going to be into this thing? Are you no, doing I, it? I'll watch clips from it, but both those guys are a little, they're a little, a little bit, little bit. <laughs> yeah. little bit. Gonna, they're drinking wine in the first one. They're drinking wine. Exactly. As they talk yeah. about it. Like, oh. No, there, there's, there's an old episode of South Park where they go to San Francisco and everybody is just farting in the glasses and sniffing it. There's a little <laughs> bit of that. There's a little bit of that with, that with both those guys where, you know, they're just going to sit there and be like, well, I tell you what I would have done in the 1958 finals. You're like, yeah, <laughs> dude, stop. Just stop. So there's going to be a little bit of that. There will be some really good stuff, but I'm pretty sure they'll all be like clips and someone will post it and it'll get like a three minute clip of them saying something really good. And then the rest of it, I can, I don't, I don't know if I can sit can through like up. an hour yeah. straight of those two guys telling you why they're the two greatest basketball minds in the world. And That's I like, true. like, That's I like JJ Reddick's podcast. He does, he says a lot of really good stuff. I respect LeBron James as a player, but yeah, he's, they, they both, they both have a little <laughs> chip on their shoulder of, you know, which is why they're so good, but they, there's a little chip on the shoulder that as somebody who, who loves basketball too, you're like, hey, come on guys. I just want to enjoy the game. Just want to enjoy it. it. No, no, no. I get it. I really do. Uh, all right. Uh, good stuff there. We'll come back. We'll get into uh, my Jade Baron take. Uh, I will play some Nick Casario and also we'll talk Cowboys. We'll do all that on the other side right here on uh, the horn. This is the broadcast featuring my man, Patrick Davis. I'm lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis coming right back.
All right, welcome back to the Rodcast. Top of the charts Tuesday. That's when my co-host, the Idillionaire, uh, Patrick Davis, he plays a jam so reached the top of the Billboard charts on this day in history. Uh, having a great time with that, always with the musically themed days of the week. Also, Patrick Davis uh, came up with the big fat poll of the day. If you want to follow him via Twitter, you can do so at It's Patrick Davis, but you also can go over to the text line, 512-447-3776. Um, that way you can uh, follow the conversation on the big fat poll of the day. Day, uh, which is what Patrick big fat ball of the day who is your favorite underdog in sports and we're looking for a player on this one we may go into teams tomorrow or the next day we'll figure out if we get into that but uh who is your favorite underdog in sports whether it's like a Kurt Warner bagging groceries to Super Bowl winner and MVP oh, Jose Altuve yeah. just living in Venezuela having to convince a scout to give him a mm-hmm. shot and then ends up winning an MVP with the and in, in all World Series. Muggsy Bogues five three in the NBA. I mean, there's That's there's good. there's some good ones in there. We had one that we had one first. Tony Romo is somebody came up. People had him. Jim Abbott was is a one handed pitcher. So being really short makes you an underdog, even if you're really good. Like what about Kyler Murray? He's really short and has a. He's not delight. five is three. He underdog. No, but he's really small, though. He's the smallest football starting quarterback in the history of the NFL. But he was 5'5". Five, five, he's a really small it. dude. He's probably the smallest. I, he might be the smallest Heisman Trophy winner ever. Really. He's also He also hasn't I mean, done anything in the NFL. Well, I'm just saying, I, as I, an I underdog, mean, I mean, you're naming people that are short. You got to be short and not real good. Is that what you're basically saying? No, no, you have to be short. You got to be the shortest guy. You got to be short and bad. No, because no, you, be, you have to be short and really, really good. That's what I'm saying, but you're an underdog. Because- he, he was short and really, really good. He was like extraordinarily short for a guy that cheats what he achieved. Have you seen a guy as short as Kyler Murray be as good as Kyler Murray? In the NFL? At quarterback? In the NFL, in, he in hasn't done it period. At the, co- at the college level, too. He did Have well you seen a quarterback level. as short as Kyler Murray be as good as Kyler Murray in college? Best best player in the, in the country that short. I mean, in but like Have two inches that? shorter. But like two, that's what I'm saying. It's like two inches. That's what I'm saying. Oh, like, well, how, much, how, how short do you want the guy to be? You want to be 5'3"? Five, five, three. Three. I mean, good five, lord. 5'3", is Bugsy Bogues. And Jose Altuve. But he's playing. 5'5". Five, five. Like, these uh, are, I'm, these I'm, are, I'm saying, I'm saying, shouldn't he be in the same category with Kyler those guys? Murray, Kyler Murray is, is average height for an adult male. So for oh. a quarterback, he is small, but he's, he's at average height for an adult male. He's just short for a quarterback. Jose Altuve and Muggsy yeah. Bogues are objectively short for men. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's I, why I feel you, there. but I, you, you got a lot of stipulations in your, <laughs> your underdog. Thing. Hey, look, you can say you keep coming up with more and more stipulations. Like, I, I try to, I'm trying to go with your vibe. You're like, all right, I like short. I'm like, all right, I'll go with short. And you got a, you got a stipulation there. So I'll let you handle it because <laughs> every time I come up with somebody, you come up with another stipulation. Look, why Kyler Murray, that guy can, is dying underdog. You can say Kyler Murray's an <laughs> underdog for being, but I, again, I don't think he's anybody's favorite either. I know you're right. I'm not saying he's in well, Oklahoma. For some people, he's probably their favorite. If you're a Sooner, he's probably your favorite. Uh, but uh, I, I get it. I get it. All right. Bugsy Bogues is a lot shorter. I get you on that. I'm just talking about he's one of the shortest, I don't know, probably the shortest starting quarterback in history of the league. That'd be interesting. Why I gotta look that up. He might be. I just uh, no. I think he. I think he is. I don't think you. I don't think there's anybody shorter. Than you don't that think, but like back back in the day, you don't think that there was. Maybe, back when they were smoking in, in the locker room, era. when they were smoking in the yeah, locker maybe, room, and maybe got their their stunt their growth stunted. <laughs> yeah, pre modern era, you could be right about that, but modern era, I think he's definitely got to be short. But there you go. That's good. it's a good conversation because yeah, it depends on your definition of underdog, uh, which Patrick's got a really strict definition. Of underdog, so don't be don't be loose with that thing. Uh, that's the big fat poll today: five one two four four seven three seven seven six. All right, well, we'll get back to some NFL discussion. We got to play some sound from Nick Casario here. Uh, we're also going to talk Cowboys here in a second uh but i want to first give my uh jade baron take something that's happening with texas spring football which uh they're going to have texas spring football starting today matter of fact i believe they're already at practice if i'm not mistaken while uh we are doing this show they are starting practice i saw my man chip brown over at horns 24 7 who does a great job he reported last week that uh texas has been cross-training my man jade baron at field safety, field corner, and the star position, which is the nickel position for them, the slot corner. Uh, If they are doing it now, I applaud them. This is something that I said last season they should have been doing. It's something I also said a couple of months ago that if they want to improve his draft stock after the video broke that he's going to be wearing uh, Huff Daddy's number, Michael Huff's number, and they want him to be a Thorpe Award finalist and they want to improve his draft stock, you should showcase his versatility. 
uh, because he is one of the most versatile defenders in all of college football. And basically, you should promote him as that the most versatile defensive back in college football today. And you should move him around based on the matchup so teams don't know exactly where he is, so they cannot exploit your secondary um, based on the rigidity of the defense and he's always going to be in the nickel and the nickel doesn't travel when you got formation to boundary uh too many rigidity i think too much rigidity within that defense you move him around and you give your defense a little bit more malleability and when you have versatility in your in your secondary on your defense period it just gives you solutions to possible problems the offense is going to present you they're trying to present you with matchup problems make run defenders pass defenders make pass defenders run defenders and what do you want of versatile defenders who are not at a matchup disadvantage or uh, when the offense tries to manipulate and engineer those types of matchups and that's kind of a throwback and i think jade baron is kind of a throwback player but you know jade baron if he's going to be playing all those different positions, depending on where you need him that week or where he can be most useful that week, you can move him to field corner. Or if you have depth at nickel, then maybe you can move him the corner. You have depth at corner, you can keep him at nickel. You can even move him around to safety, I think. And I, I, I'm glad they're doing it. It's something I, like I said, advocated for even last season. His best position, I'm not sure what that'll be. I, I remember talking to Quandre Diggs about him playing corner, playing nickel, and playing safety, played all those positions at Texas and in the NFL. And he said his most uh, the t the position he loves the most, that he has the most fun. He thinks is nickel. He thinks he's most impactful at the nickel position. And I think it's because he's an action junkie. But when I asked him about where he made the most plays, where he made the most splash plays, where he made the biggest impact, where he got all of his accolades and achievements in the NFL, it was at safety. Because like Jade Barron, I, you guys have heard me call Jade Barron this too. He's a football investigator, which means he just takes different clues and different hints that the offense is giving him in the pre-snap, the down, the distance, the personnel package, the formation, uh, the film study, the trends and the patterns and the tendencies. He takes all that and thin slices right before the snap based on all he's doing some thin slicing before the snap try to figure out and narrow down how the offense is going to try to exploit and attack them and then when the ball is snapped he gets confirmation of his hypothesis and he's got to do it in a snap second but at safety you get even more time to do that he's done a really good job of it at corner but if you uh, at, excuse me at nickel but if you notice teams start to take advantage of him late in the year why because his keys are uh and his his technique is 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 so meticulous right and he is fearless and there is no hesitation in him when he's reading his keys they start to hit him up with double moves uh the out nub they start to use his keys against him well when you're playing safety teams can't really you know they they try to use keys against you but you have enough time to recover because you're so far from the ball the closer you are to the ball the faster everything happens so at nickel you're in, like i said you're operating in a quantum realm you don't have time to really process everything you can do a pre-snap process but post-snap Everything happens so fast. You really don't have time to process what's going on. It's just muscle memory and instinct that's happening a lot of time in there. That's why your technique and your fundamentals are so important. But at safety, like Quandre, if you're a football investigator, you get a better view of the field and you get better perspective. You get more clues. More clues for a really good investigator will help them solve the case. And that's why he's better at safety. He makes more plays at safety because that's what Quandre is. Quandre's not a freak athlete, neither should they. All right, they're not going to they're not going to really um, be, you know, I think a freak of nature, an elite athlete when they start testing at the combine. Um, you know, I think if Quandre was below average in his 40. He's below average height, but he's above average football intelligence because he's from a football family. I played with his brother at Texas, Quandre Diggs. I've been knowing Quandre since he's been eight years old. He was coming around the facility. So he's got a really five, five football IQ because he's an old soul. Same thing with Jaday Barron. He wants to be a defensive coordinator when he's done playing football. I don't know if he has elite speed. I'm not sure he has uh, elite measurables, but I know he has elite football intelligence. And you put him at safety, he's got time to process those clues and help you solve the case. And that's why I'm glad Texas is moving him around. And by the way, versatility is the key to the reinvention of DBU. When I was on the 40 acres, that's what coach Akina did to adapt the uh, evolutionary adaptation to the air raid offense. When it started to spread after Oklahoma won the national championship running it, Texas uh, uh, adaptation and counter to that was we need cover guys on the field, nothing but cover guys everywhere. Yes, you can play in our secondary. All right, but you have to be able to cover that's the number one priority, which is why he put 
Quinn Jammer and myself at corner. He put Nathan Vasher and Ahmad Brooks at safety. Cool guys who had played corner. Uh, my man Quinn Jammer came from safety to corner. I went from nickel to corner, but everybody in our secondary could cover. And they started recruiting really elite coverage specialists, but they had very versatile skill sets. And I went and did the math. If you look at the DBs who have played on the NFL roster, drafted or undrafted since 1999, 2000, which is when my man Quinn Jammer was there. Uh, you're talking about over 55%, damn near 60% of those DBs played multiple positions at Texas or in the NFL. Versatility. You go look at the Denver Broncos now. It's obvious Sean Payton values it. He's got five Longhorns there, four uh, on the defensive side of the ball, and all and three of those four played multiple positions at Texas. Malcolm Roach, DN, D tackle, inside linebacker, outside linebacker. Uh, my man uh, Br Brandon Jones played nickel and played safety. PJ Locke played nickel, played safety, came in as a corner. The versatility was always the key to the reinvention of DBU. And I think Sark now has figured it out too. Because if you look at Sark's recruiting class, he just brought in those five defensive backs in the uh, recruiting class and Makuba coming in the transfer portal. When he actually broke down their skill set in the uh, in the signing day press conference, when he talked about Kobe Black, he mentioned versatile and called him a three position player. When he talked about Makuba, he said he was versatile. Dabo Sweeney says he can play any position in secondary. When he talked about Johnson Rubel, he said he was a versatile position flex player. When he talked about Santana Wilson, he said he has versatility in his skill set and he's versatile. His quote about all the defensive backs were uh, all have the ability to play coverage and play man coverage, whether they end up at safety, star, or corner. Sound familiar? It's exactly what Coach Akina was thinking. So maybe it's Coach Gideon, who was from the Coach Akina, uh, you know, uh, years at DB, and maybe he's bringing in that philosophy, or maybe great minds think alike. Whatever it may be, I'm glad they're prioritizing versatility now at the defensive back position with the guys they're bringing in, but with the guys they have on the 40 acres right now. Okay. There you go. That's my Jaday Baron rant uh, about Texas spring football. We'll talk a lot more Texas spring football, of course, with the uh, the rest of the week um, and rest of the month, actually. So we're excited to be have an excuse to talk football, especially on the 40 acres. All right. All right, I, I, got, I do have I Sorry, do have some quarterback heights for you real quick. Go ahead. So uh, the one in the closest modern era, Doug Flutie. So also 5'10". Yeah, 5'9", yes. 5'10". So Doug Flutie is your guy that's in the closest. And then you have to go back. Uh, the first quarterback of the, the Cowboys, Eddie LeBaron was five seven and then okay. historically Davy O'Brien back in the 30s was five seven that is about all I can give you though but Doug Flutie is really the example that you're going to take is the other way who at this point in NFL career you could say has had a better NFL career than Kyler Murray but Kyler Murray's career is still pretty young yeah you could say that yeah you could you could say that for, for now and it just hasn't been many quarterbacks but you're right pre-modern yes. era of football when guys were just running the football. Uh, I'm sure you got some quarterbacks that were really short. But once the NFL decided height was one of the prerequisites of being yes. a really good quarterback. And, and by the way, Bill Walsh, he didn't like quarterbacks that were too tall. He would warn against quarterbacks that were over like 6'5". He was like, no, 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 they're too tall. They can't move well enough in the pocket. So he was actually big on, on quarterbacks being in between a certain height. It's tall enough, but not too tall. Uh, okay, let's get to Nick Casario. I'm not sure what Nick Casario values at quarterback, but he sure knows how to pick him. He knocked it out of the park with C.J. Stroud. And uh, he actually was on 610 recently talking about his philosophy on free agency and talking about the trade with the Minnesota Vikings. First, let's hear about Casario talking about his philosophy on free agency, period. Uh, then we'll uh, get to his cut talking about the, the recent trade they had with the Minnesota Vikings. Here's Nick Casario on 610 really started in January as we started to go through the free agent process. It's not too dissimilar to what we do with the draft. You start with a large pool of players and you pare it down to a, I would say, realistic number, a workable number for your team that if you have the opportunity to add those players to your team, you're going to consider them. So you kind of group them accordingly based on their role. And then the big part is valuing the player. Like, what does the market say the value of that player is? You're willing to pay X dollars for whatever play, whatever you think the player is worth. Now, that doesn't mean there's not going to be competition. So you're kind of subject to the marketplace as well. So I think the big thing is just being prepared, being disciplined, and just going through the process and not getting too fixated on one particular position or one particular player and then start to make decisions that are emotional in nature. You, you sort of have to take the emotion out, and you sort of have to take a very pragmatic, um, diligent, rational approach. And 
just kind of keep the dialogue moving. And, you know, hopefully we were able to add some players that will be able to help our team here um, this, up, this upcoming season. I'd say free agency sometimes a little bit like the draft when there's a immediate reaction relative to draft grades, free agency grades, what happened. And I think we, we all just have to take a step back and, you know, a lot of that stuff will unfold once the season starts. So we're certainly excited about the players that we had the opportunity to add to our team. By the same token, we lost some players that had a significant impact on the Houston Texans, not only this past year, but in previous seasons as well. But that's the nature of the NFL. But overall, <clears throat> I think we're pleased with how the process went. We're pleased and, and certainly grateful for the efforts of so many people in our building. Uh, there you go. So they're concerned. We're talking about the free agency period they've had. A lot of people think that the Texans uh, are winning free agency right now, or at least one of the teams winning free agency right now. Uh, but also he made a move and Nick Cuxario is the nickname that he's gotten from Texans fans, which I'll admit that nickname, it, it's apropos. It, it, it applies because he's made more trades than any GM in the NFL since uh, he came to the Texans, including a record. I think he had eight trades in the last NFL draft. So at least he's got a reputation now among front office execs in the league. If you want to make a deal, hit up Cuxario. He'll make a deal. He's a let's make a deal guy. And that's a good reputation to have. That means teams are constantly blowing up your phone when they want to make a deal. Um, he talked about his recent trade with Minnesota um, and how that all went down and what was the thought process in it. Here is Nick Casario on 610. We try to be pretty open-minded and pretty progressive in our thinking. And just we're always evaluating um, information and evaluating situations. So I'd say the way we were positioned – Prior to the trade, we were picking a 23, then we were picking a 59, then we had kind of a late third and the two fourths. Um, and you have discussions during the course of, I'd say, this time of year. I don't want to say you talk to every team, but you kind of talk to every team, whether it's about players. So as an example, with the trades that were done, you know, we did a few trades, other teams have done a few trades, so you're always kind of talking. And then you also have discussion potentially about the draft, about positioning. You know, we had the trade that took place last year between Chicago and Carolina. So different teams are at different stages and there's going to be different dialogues about different things. So um, we received a, a few calls um, about that pick. And then, you know, we had a conversation with Minnesota about their situation. So we kind of went back and forth and we looked at the information and D'Amico and I, and again, we talk about everything. So no decisions are made in a vacuum. So every situation that comes up, we look at everything in totality. We look at everything from a top-down perspective and make sure we understand the ramifications of whatever decisions that we make. Um, and so based on the discussions that we had and then based on the discussions that we had with Minnesota, when that opportunity was presented, we felt it, it made sense for us. So we've talked about this on the show as well. The draft is <laughs> – there's nothing more inexact probably out there than the draft. Mm -hmm. So some of this is really just about positioning. Um, and potentially pools of players or clusters of players. So let's call it you're picking 23. So probably anywhere from 25 to 40, you're going to probably have a very similar type of player or you don't know exactly who is going to be. But I would I would say our college staff has done a phenomenal job. We've met multiple times. We could sit here today right now and maybe have an idea of if we had a pool, X number of players who was going to be available at those spots you know, would we have players that we feel comfortable with? Probably the answer is yes. But by the same token, if we were to move out of that, like what's the opportunity cost of moving out of that pick? So, you know, moving back 19 spots or whatever it is to the top of the second round there in the 40s. And I would say when you go back and, you know, you you, you can find good football players all throughout the draft. Yep. So when you go back specifically to, let's call it that area, you know, over the last few years, you know, guys like Petrie, Maffe, Brisker, you know, even last year, Laporta Mayer, mm -hmm. you know, Bergeron, Musgrave, Branch. Uh, there you go. So Nick Casario talking about his mindset or at least the rationale behind trading out of the first round in this upcoming draft. Uh, and basically what I heard, just kind of reading between the lines, was they only have a certain number of first round grades on guys. Uh, they probably got 20 first round grades. They're picking at 23. The players that they really like, they suspect will be gone by that pick, which means they'll be paying a lot of guaranteed money to a player they don't have a first round grade on why not trade out of the first round since you don't have a first round grade on those guys you're going to be picking right there in that area in that slot and then trade to the second round where you might have you might have 40 second round grades 
first round grades, Joel, yeah. nobody ever has 32. You might have 40 first round grades, ton of uh, second round grades. And if you have that many second round grades, then shoot, then get out of that spot. And then you have a better selection in terms of value, by the way, guaranteed money also couldn't have when you get, you go from the first round to the second round. So you're investing less and then an opportunity for that player to outplay their contract and outplay the value that you acquired uh, in that acquisition. So that's what I think he's looking at. And he said, we're going to have a same, the similar type of player from 25 to 40, which to me means none of those guys have first round. They don't have 25 to 40 of those guys having first round grades. So let's go to 42, which where they'll be where they'll have a better chance to pick a player of, you know, of, of equal value for that round as opposed to being in the first round and picking a guy who doesn't have a first round grade for you. Yeah. I mean, it's basically the concept of, well, if we only have, you know, five A pluses, you know, 10 A's and another 10 A minuses. Well, we don't necessarily need to be in there because we'd rather have, we'd rather have a B than a B plus or two B's than a B one B plus. Cause now we'll have two B's. Mm. We have yeah. two of them. There's two guys yeah. we're getting out of this now that are both B players and could be A plus players. We don't know. They, they, we we know they could be really great, but we know we, we can get two guys that are pretty good, and we don't necessarily have to get the guy that you know we think off the board right away is just slightly better. And if we want to trade up, if someone falls, we can trade up. And now because we have a pick in the next year's draft, it helps us if we want to trade up next year. If we yep. sit there and next year and the draft looks deeper and. We're in a place where our draft picks a little bit lower in uh, the first round because we did so well. And we think, well, we'd like to move up to 18 next year. We'll have two seconds and a first next year to help move up into that pick as well. Yeah, no, that's a good point there. Um, and yeah, I, I, I think it's actually a savvy move uh, by Nick Asario. And by the way, it's such a, a Patriot Belichick move. The Patriots. And I want to say the 10 years from like 2005 to around 2015 or 16, they uh, acqu acquired more second round picks and accumulated more second round picks than any team in the league because they believe, well, first of all, they're always picking late in the first round. But they believe, hey, man, you can get because of the incompetence and the miscalculation in the draft of other teams, you'll get a couple of first round talents that will fall right to you at the top of the second round just because teams, they're not great at drafting because it is such a crap shoot. Uh, if you're not great at drafting, you better be good at free agency. Seems like Casario is pretty good at both. He had, he acquired Danico Autry on the defensive line. I I got to start watching Danico, Danico Autry. and got to do some research on him because I hadn't thought of him as that much of an impact player. But listen to the way Nick Casario describes Danico Autry, uh, their free agent acquisition for the defensive line, um, and how much he has a kind of a man crush on Danico Autry. Here's Nick Casario on 16. Specific to Danico, I mean, this guy's a badass. I mean, this guy's a junkyard dog. Like, if you go into a dark alley, like, you want this guy behind you. Like, this is a bad MFer. I mean, and a really good football player who cares about football. And, and we've had a play against him over the last couple of years and you know Tennessee and then he was in Indianapolis but you know, glad he's on our side and you know we're excited about um what potentially he could bring there you go um badass junkyard dog bad mf -er. your coach described you like that he likes you it sounds like he probably tried to acquire him in the past he's talking about him on other teams and facing him yeah. and it just didn't work out um but yeah I gotta start watching and, and I can believe D'Amico Ryan's tried to acquire him in San Francisco too could, probably i can imagine both point. of them had looked at him and had him on film and said that's a guy i'd love to i'd that's love to guy. have him yeah that's a dude that's a dude and a dog and we need him uh they hopefully got a lot of dudes and dogs on the defensive line we know this is a big part of actually maybe the biggest part of the roster construction for the texans because that's D'Amico ryan's coming from that san francisco system he talks about it the, the most critical uh, piece of that defense and part of the defense is the defensive line. Here's Casario on that defensive line with the acquisition of Denis Autry and now Daniel Hunter. Try to do is just create some front flexibility. So we have some guys can play on the end of the line of scrimmage. We have some guys that are specifically interior players. We have some players that maybe have some outside inside flexibility. So um, I'd say we have a lot of players that, that have a lot of experience that have played a lot of football. I mean, even on the inside, I mean, Fadakasi has started 33 games over the last two years for Jacksonville. I mean, Settle played 400 snaps last year. 
Um, you know, Khalil was, gave us some, you know, two or 300 snaps last year. Um, and then we have some guys that can kind of float inside that play on the perimeter as well. As a matter of fact, you know, we're still kind of working through free agency. Um, and say there might be a player or two that pops up where we can add them to the group. So we're going to play eight or nine defensive linemen. D'Amico has said this. It starts at the front. So we're just trying to create as much flexibility and optionality in the front as possible. They might not be done uh, with the D-line, too. And I love you talking about versatility. It's one of those words of the day. The versatility on that defensive line. Guys that can play on the edge. Guys that can play inside. Guys that can play multiple shades up front. All right, uh, so there you go. Some Texans conversation. Cowboys conversation. The Cowboys did make a move. Uh, they did sign, re-sign Rico Dowdle to a one-year uh, $1.2 million deal. So shout out to uh, Cowboys fans out there. I uh, had to say bye to Tyron Smith officially. I think he penned a farewell letter, a uh, very uh, sentimental farewell message to Cowboys fans uh, after 10 seasons with the Cowboys. I didn't realize how good um, Tyron Smith was last year. I got to admit, I didn't realize he was, I mean, I know he was good, but he's still, when he plays, he's still playing at a really high level. If you look at one-on-one situations, one-on-one, so uh, one-on-one blocking situations, he was in a one-on-one situation, 84% of his pass blocking snaps. That's the third most among left tackles. He allowed a 6.7% pressure rate. That was the lowest among left tackles in a one-on-one situation. He was first in pressure rate allowed among left tackles. And as I mentioned, first in one-on-one pressure rate allowed and third in one-on-one rate pass blocking opportunities. That Dak was only pressured on 28% of his dropbacks last season. That was the second lowest in the NFL behind Tua. I mean, he, he was well protected last season, and now you're losing two guys off of that O-line, not only Tom Smith, but losing your center, too. I think Dak's got to be more concerned about this offensive line overhaul than anybody else. Did not realize, Patrick, that Tyron Smith had been that effective. Man, he was uh, he was an anchor for him. Had, had been for 10 years, but he definitely he was he's still an anchor for him last season. Yeah, he was in the, when he was playing, when he was healthy. And I think when he was that's, playing. And that's part of it is, you know, they keep going in, and that's why they wanted that that contract that did have a lot of incentives based in it, based on playing time. But he signed that deal with with New York. So it makes you wonder how much of a pay cut did they want him to take. Yeah, but if you're Dak Prescott and you say, well, I'm going under a different center next year and I have a different left tackle next year, two of the most important players for a quarterback, and then you're also taking my wide receiver three, which we've always, as Dak has always been a fan of a wide receiver three. You're taking him away from me because Gallup has now been released. So I, I get it's if you're Dak Prescott, there's a lot of change. And my current running back room is Rico Doddle and Deuce Vaughn. Yeah. There's a there's That's a lot of questions room. if you're Dak Prescott yeah. that again, if they're saying I'll sign you to an extension, I may say no. You're not giving me any help right now. Why do I want to come back here if you guys aren't going to help me? Ooh, man. I, I never thought about that, but yeah, Dak can't be happy. What, no, I mean you do I, I'm happy and you haven't paid CD yet either. You have not paid CD. So I don't even know if I have my wide receiver. So I re-signed with you for five years. You don't keep CD. Brandon Cook sleeves. I don't have offensive linemen, and I am the scapegoat for the Cowboys for the next four or five years while we try and rebuild. I don't know if that's what I want to do if I'm Dak Prescott. Yeah. It's a good point. And whatever Dak's next deal is, that's going to be his last big deal. I'm sure he'll sign yeah. you know, as an older quarterback. Well, unless 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 Atlanta wants to sign him for $180 million. <laughs> <laughs> then, yeah, all bets are off. <laughs> yeah, you're right. Great point. Great point there. Uh, but this will be what a four year deal. This will take him. This will put him at what, like 33 or something like that, 33, yeah. 34, maybe when his contract is up. So this is the one he wants to sign another big one before uh, his uh, kind of he hits the, the end of his career, those twilight years. All right. Uh, good stuff there. Talking. And by the way, lo, lo, little nugget for Cowboys fans out there. This is crazy. I couldn't believe this. Cowboys do have the second late, lowest payroll right now in the NFL um, and the least amount of salary cap space. That is for Cowboys. That's why they call Stephen Jones cat boy. That is that is really, really tough to be able to have the second lowest payroll, but also the least amount of salary cap space. So that's probably why you see the Cowboys very, very reluctant to make any moves. And everything is a move to clear a little cap space here, clear cap space there, sign a cheap guy here, resign a cheap guy there. Um, that's pretty much the only moves they can really make at this point. Uh, okay. Uh, we got to get to Roger around the day. We'll do that on the other side. We're talking quarterbacks in the NFL. Is there an NFL quarterback evaluation 
crisis. So does the NFL has a do they have a quarterback evaluation issue? We'll discuss that on the other side when we come back right here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis. I'm Lifetime Long One Rod Babers coming back on the horn. Hey, what's up, folks? Lifetime Longhorn Rod Babers here. Let's talk about Dr. Greg Eckert and his all-star team. Um, he can uh, handle any of your uh, dental needs, uh, any concerns about your dental health or hygiene. Uh, Dr. You, Dr. Greg Eckert, and his uh, his fantastic all-star team are just the place for you. Now, you've heard all of us here on the horn give our testimonies about Dr. You and how uh, he does a great job, no matter what it is. General dentistry, uh, uh, teeth whitening, dentures, porcelain crowns, veneers, dental implants, full mouth reconstruction, even root canal therapy. Happy folks, I had to have all of my wisdom teeth removed. Went to Dr. Yu just for a teeth cleaning, get a checkup, and made sure the checkup was thorough. It was thorough enough to find out that my wisdom teeth growing in sideways, which uh, could have led to it being a really disastrous <laughs> situation for me. But Dr. Yu did not let it get there at all. They uh, broke down uh, the procedure to me, uh, informed me and educated me about the process. Uh, and I was really comfortable with it, eased any anxiety I would have about the process, uh, had the the uh, the procedure and I was back to work within three days. <laughs> uh, that's how uh, good it was with Dr. Yu and his staff. They're fantastic folks. I owe them a debt of gratitude. So it doesn't matter if it's a really serious situation like I had or something really simple like a checkup or a cleaning. Dr. Eckert is the place and he is the dentist. He is our dentist here on the horn. He should be your dentist too. Dr. Eckert can give you uh, also a brand new smile in just one day. One thing I love about him and his staff, they're always on the cutting edge of technological advances in general dentistry. Every time I go, I'm like, hey, what, what is that? That's a new device. That's a, a new machine of some kind, but it's all designed to make sure you're getting the best quality dental care available. That's their top priority. And right now, Dr. You and his staff can give you a brand new smile in just one day permanently secured to your dental implants. No time spent without teeth. You get temporary fixtures and they complete your permanent smile. And you're going to smile again with confidence and eat freely without pain or discomfort. So if you've been told your teeth need to be replaced, don't freak out. Just call Dr. U. It's a complimentary consultation. So you got nothing to lose but everything to gain and learn about this revolutionary alternative to dentures. A brand new smile in just one day. It sounds too good to be true. It's not. It's just Dr. U. Give them a call. 512-345-3166. That's 512-345-3166. Or visit Dr. Eckert dot com d r u e c k e r t dot com
All right, I want to talk about the uh, quarterback class that is coming up because there are a lot of people that believe, and, and they're probably right about this, uh, with all the mock drafts that I've seen, the post-combine mock drafts, that you're going to have three quarterbacks taken with the first three picks. They're going to go one, two, and three at quarterback. Uh, with, uh, of course, Chicago with number one, Washington, and then New England, unless there's a trade of some kind. You still may end up, somebody's trading up, they're probably trading up for a quarterback. The last three times in a common era draft that you had quarterback selected one, two, and three overall, you had in 2021, Trevor Lawrence went to Jacksonville at number one overall. The Jets took Wilson, Zach Wilson at number two overall, and then San Francisco 49ers took Trey Lance at number three overall. And only one of those three has worked out, and that's Trevor Lawrence. Um, 1999, you had three quarterbacks taken with the first three overall picks: Tim Couch, uh, and then Donovan McNabb, then Achilles Smith. Looks Donovan McNabb. Donovan McNabb is the only quarterback that worked out there. And 1971, you had uh, Jim Plunkett, Archie Manning, and Dan Pastorini that went with the uh, first three picks overall in the draft. And hell, that was yeah, the higher success rate there, I guess. But it, in the common era draft since 1967, so we're looking at here, 130 quarterbacks drafted in the first round, 61 of those 130 quarterbacks is around a 47% hit rate, have won a playoff game, around 45% of them, 58, have went to a Pro Bowl. And top five picks, that number increases, right? Top five picks make a Pro Bowl at a 60, almost 61% clip. Uh, they won a playoff game at a 54% clip. It's all about since 1967, top five picks, top 10 picks. Uh, they make Pro Bowls around 54% of the time. They win a playoff game around 50% of the time. Top 15 picks, negligible difference. 53% of the time they make a Pro Bowl, 49% of the time they win a playoff game, and you go first round picks, period. Uh, we just told you you're at 45%, you're at 47%. Um, so essentially the, the NFL, I mean, you, you gotta if you want if you want the elite quarterbacks, you're gonna have to get them at the top of the NFL draft for the most part. We know that. And but now the NFL is looking at a lot of uh, quarterback misevaluations for the most part. I mean, look at that 2021 class. We just talked about they had three quarterbacks taken with the top three overall picks. Trevor Lawrence, he's still a starter for you, but Zach Wilson, he may be traded, may not, but he's never going to be a starter again in the NFL. At least not that I think and believe. He could be one of these quarterback resurrections that we've seen, like a Baker Mayfield uh, or a Geno Smith, right? He could be one of those cases. I'm not saying it's out of the realm of possibility, just not very likely. Uh, Trey Lance has already been traded. He got traded to the Cowboys for a fourth. Justin Fields uh, was taken 11th in that draft. He's been traded for a sixth, and Mac Jones already traded. So out of those five guys that were taken in the top 15 picks, which is kind of what they're saying in this draft, they're saying that you have five quarterbacks taken in the first round. Only one of those quarterbacks has worked out. And hell, three of those guys have been traded already. And you could end up getting four of those guys traded if Zach Wilson gets traded. And it's very similar to that 2022 quarterback class where you only had one quarterback taken in the first round. But none of the quarterbacks in that class really worked out at all. Kenny Pickett, Desmond Ritter, both traded, along with Sam Howell has been traded. He's probably the best of that group But Bailey Zappi, Matt Corral, Malik Willis. This stat here is mind blowing that there were 19 quarterbacks selected in the NFL draft uh, from tw in, in 2021 and 2022. Only two of those are expected to start in week one. That's Trevor Lawrence. That's Brock Purdy. It just shows you how tough it is to evaluate the quarterback position. There are only 11 quarterbacks of all of the 30 that were drafted from 2013 to 2022. Only 11 of them are still with the team that drafted them and one of those guys is zach wilson so pretty soon it'll be just 10 uh so it is it is a really tough position to evaluate the late great bill walsh said it best uh very few uh coaches can coach the quarterback position uh even fewer can evaluate the quarterback position that is truer today than it was when he said it 40 years ago it's just almost an impossible position to project and evaluate. And for the NFL, I think we're at the point now where I don't know if it's tougher to evaluate and, pro and project in their position. I mean, that could be the case. It could just be the expectations that we have for the quarterback position. Because when you pick quarterback, you're not just looking for a starter anymore. You're looking for an elite quarterback that can put the cape on. And I think that's a part of it, too. It's not just enough to find a starter. Look at Alex Smith, two times. Great starter in the NFL. For Jim Harbaugh with the 49ers, stable, you know, stabilized that franchise when they kept hiring new coaches and offensive coordinators. And Andy Reid, who's the best offensive mind in football today, he had Alex Smith and they were winning the division, yeah. going to playoff games. He was, but he was decent was in Washington. 
He was exactly, but he that's not enough yeah. when you're constantly trying to upgrade to a Patrick Mahomes or even to a Colin Kaepernick who you go, well, he wasn't better than Alex Smith, but his upside was better. To your point, Patrick, is the ceiling is what Jim Harbaugh saw when he brought in Colin yeah. Kaepernick. All about that ceiling. And when you do draft prep and when you do evaluations of talent and when you're scouting people, you talk about ceilings and floors. You talk about what is the worst case scenario, what's their floor at, if you know if this player, we get him, and what's the worst? Well, what's worse is they're a game manager. Brock Purdy is a perfect floor example. Brock Purdy's floor was pretty high. You looked at what he did at Iowa State, and you said, "Look, we know what this guy can do. I don't think he's going to be a terrible player. He may not be the best in the NFL, but I, he's pretty, his floor is pretty high. But his ceiling wasn't through the roof. But if you look at a Caleb Williams, his floor is really low. His floor is he could be busted out of the league." You could bench him week four and he could never play in the NFL again because he just doesn't have the mental the mental capacity for it. Or maybe he runs around too much and get, gets sacked and his sat rate goes through the roof. Maybe all that. Or maybe he does, as you say, put on the cape and he is the first quarter, the first quarterback to take the Bears to anything. Because I don't know if there's been a quarterback to take the Bears anywhere in the history of that organization defense took it places yeah. not the quarterback. so yeah. you know it's all about that ceiling and and at this point because it's so tied to the jobs of general managers and coaches that you just kind of have to look at it and everybody goes look we need this we need the highest ceiling possible because that's how i get a raise that's how i keep my job and if if he's if he's just good i still probably get fired because we're not winning super bowls and if we're not winning super bowls i get fired yep that's exactly right. Average coach, I think the average coach's tenure is three and a half years now. Yeah. Three and a half to four years. You might be fired. It might be one and done in the NFL. They don't like it. So you're right about that. That definitely plays. The lack of patience starts with the ownership because they have a lack of patience in the, in the coaches. They're not going to wait around for them to take five, six years to turn things around. And then that coach, because the pressure put on him to win right away, he has to put pressure on the quarterback, whoever they bring in. You got to play right away, and I need you to get closer to your ceiling right away. Yeah. I need you to hit. It. If you don't, then we might have to move on. If you can't hit that ceiling right away, and, and, and it, you're right. So it's it's like uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things that's self fulfilling prophecy almost. And it's weird because like if you look at the 2017 draft, that was a draft that was based more on the floor. The floor was the, the problem. It, you said Mitch Trubisky is the first quarterback taking that draft because his floor was a lot higher. So his ceiling wasn't the same as when you watch Patrick Mahomes stuff and you said, man, this guy can put up 50 points in a game. Or you watched uh, Deshaun Watson and saw what he did at Clemson and you go, that guy's a winner. Man, he has the potential to be this great player. I think that you looked at Mitch Trubisky and you said, he could be good. He could be a great system quarterback. But his floor is, you know, he'll be in the league. He's going to play in the league for, for 10 years minimum, which he still is. He's still getting jobs easily. Yeah. So yeah. his floor is a lot higher. But then you take Patrick Mahomes and Deshaun Watson, and those guys fall a little bit lower because their floors, they could have been guys who weren't able to play in an NFL style of football. And you saw their their ceilings made them still first-round picks. They're still top 15 picks because their ceilings were high, but their floor is lower. And now it's kind of flipped a little bit on its back end where teams are now saying, I don't care at all about the floor. I just yeah. don't care. I only right. care about that ceiling. Yeah. No, I think I think that's – you hit the nail on the head there, brother. I think you – I think you nailed it. That's exactly what their quarterback evaluation now is about. Who's got the highest ceiling? Because that's the guy that can put the cape on. Yeah. And you then they don't even look at the floors anymore. Anthony Richards is a prime example. Yeah. And, care and, about the and when we talk about when we talk about the Cowboys cap situation, when you talk about the window being open, and you're saying we need to win with a cape on in the first five years. So building a system quarterback and getting a guy that where he's going to win in his second contract doesn't help us as much. As Anthony Richardson, man, maybe this guy can come in in his first couple of years, just get us somewhere. And then we have a window in that first two or three years, and we're not necessarily stuck in that second window. And now we're starting to build, and it doesn't work because we got a guy who's more of a projector. We just got a guy who can put on a cape. He can go do it. Caleb Williams is that guy. Yeah, he is that guy. It, 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 a lot of people think Jaden Daniels has more of that quality than yeah. Drake May, which is why he has surpassed him in a lot of people's yeah. draft evaluations. All right, yeah, good stuff there. All right, we'll come back. We'll wrap it up, put it in the oven. Who said that on the other side? And then we'll let you know a little sneak peek about what we're talking about tomorrow. All that and more right here on the broadcast featuring Patrick Davis on Lifetime Longhorn Rod Davis coming right back on the horn.
Hey, what's up, folks? Like Tom Longhorn, Rod Davis here. Aside from the traffic, we all love the city of Austin. What's not to love? Great people, great food, great music. Uh, this city is one of the best cities in the country. That's why people keep moving here. And yes, the traffic gets a little worse because of it. But as the city continues to grow and thrive, so do our friends over at Iron Workers Local Union 482. Many of the iconic landmarks that we love around town that make this city so unique uh, and to make it so aesthetically pleasing were created and built by the hands and skilled craftsmanship of Iron Workers Local 482, like the Pennybacker Bridge and D. Care Estate. So if you're looking for an exciting op uh, employment opportunity or if you're looking for a refreshing career change, you can become a member of Iron Workers Local 482. They're hiring over 3,000 people right now. They're offering competitive wages, competitive benefits, a pension plan, and even offering training for unskilled labor through their apprenticeship program. They don't go to the office. They're the ones who actually build it for you. So if, you take, if you're looking for an employment opportunity, maybe uh, you want to feel challenged or maybe you want to feel valued by your employer. Uh, maybe you just want to uh, change things up. Maybe uh, you want something new, uh, something refreshing. How about uh, opening up your ideas and opening up uh, your future to Iron Workers Local 482? You can maximize your potential and accept the chance of becoming the best version of yourself by applying online today at ironworkers482.org. That's ironworkers482.org. Top of the charts Tuesday when my man Patrick, the idillionaire, plays jams. I reached the top of the Billboard charts on this day in history. Uh, last uh, segment of the show when we play Who Said That? If you were listening earlier, we probably already spoiled it for you. Uh, but we're up against it, so let's get right to it. Uh, here is an audio of uh, an all-time great NFL player uh, talking about the uh, the play that he regrets the most. Uh, here's up, Patrick. We play Who Said That? The, so the Tony Romo play um, where I got a beat Tyron Smith right off the line of scrimmage fast. He came in and I was literally trying to kill Tony Romo. I told this to his face. I was trying to break his back. That was a goal. Um, and he, no idea how he knew it, but he felt my presence coming from behind. He spun out of it through a 57-yard touchdown. Um, and that ended up being the game-winning touchdown. 
So I would leave that play and uh, I would smoke. Them. And if you did, maybe you guys would work at different networks now. Who knows? Who, who, yeah. Who knows? Who knows what the one? There you go. Uh, who said that was J.J. Watt? So the, his biggest, the play that he regrets the most is the clean hit he had on Tony Romo, back turned, and then Romo pulled out some of that Romo magic. I'm a Romo sexual, so I love me some Tony Romo. <laughs> I remember that play because I'm a Texans fan too. And I was actually on my feet cheering because I'm a Romo fan. I was like, that was one of the best plays I've ever seen. Sack avoidance. Some guys have it naturally. Um, and Tony Romo definitely had that. Uh, thank you, Patrick, for all the work you do, man. You are the real MVP. There's no doubt. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you to all the folks out there listening. We appreciate you guys for all your participation. Uh, also, uh, remember, uh, tomorrow we'll be back. We'll be talking Mel Kuyper's latest mock draft. We'll be talking about Daniel Jeremiah's latest mock draft and all the spring football storylines uh, from the first day of spring practice for the Longhorns. Remember, the revolution will not be televised. We'll be talking about it right here on the broadcast. We love you guys. Have a great night. Be kind to one another. And peace.